coherent strategies specialist from the Oregon Department of Education in the Office of Early Intervention and Early Childhood Special Ed. And uh, I'm excited to be here because as many of you know, our early intervention practitioners uh, use home visiting as a vehicle for providing intervention services for children under three with disabilities. So excited to be here. Super, thank you, Meredith, and welcome. I'm uh, Sherry Alderman. I'm a developmental behavioral pediatrician and president of the Oregon Mental Health Association. Uh, Rebecca Collette, Washington County. And Rebecca, you're sitting in for? Oh, I'm sitting in for Beth Dasher today with Healthy Families. I'm Kate Wilcox with Maternal and Child Health and Oregon Health Authority. Mm -hmm. Lindsay Manson with the Amherst County Health and Human Services. I'm Beth Green. I'm the Director of Early Childhood and Family Support Research at Portland State and also the Director of the Healthy Families Oregon Statewide Evaluation. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeremy Watts. I am the new Early Learning Council Administrator. I know I'm not Alyssa, but I'm going to try to be as good. Um, I'm also the Rules Coordinator, which sounds really boring, but it's actually not. So I'm very excited to be here. Hi all, this is Elena Rivera. I'm the vice chair of this committee and I'm the senior health policy and program advisor at Children's Institute. Okay, that's in the room. So um, don't all jump in at once, but we know Marguerite. Marguerite, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. This is Marguerite Kanegi. I'm an administrator at Family Building Blocks in Salem. We are a Relief Nursery and Healthy Families and Early Head Start Service Delivery Provider. Okay, and then Erin, are you on the phone yet? Okay, uh, Benjamin? Okay, anybody else? I know there are others. That's just who I am. Yeah, hi, this is Christy Cox, flying from the Ford Family Foundation. Hey, Christy. Next. This is Athena Wickstrom. I'm the um, administrative assistant assistant for the South Central Early Learning Hub, and I'm sitting in for Jillian Wiesenberg today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Okay. So I have three on the phone: Marguerite, Christy, and Christina. Christina. Athena. Athena. Athena, correct. Athena. Athena. Okay, thank you, Athena. Sorry. Okay. All right. And we will probably reintroduce ourselves for Miriam. Okay. Um, is we'll go to public testimony. Is there any public testimony? Does anyone have any public testimony? Okay, third time's a charm. Any public testimony? Moving right along. Okay, I'm going to go to my chair's report, and first of all, on my agenda, um, Elena and I talked to Miriam, Sue, David Mandel uh, the other day. Was there anybody else on the phone? That was it, I think, just the five yeah. of us, um, about uh, the future of Best Beginnings, and she's going to come in. We've kind of vetted her her comments that she wants to make. I would encourage you all that when she comes that you ask questions. And don't be afraid to ask hard ones either. Um, because I think we're kind of wondering where where the Early Learning Division, Early Learning Council wants us to go, if they want us to go, and how they want us to go. And um, it's been quite unclear. So some of the meetings that have been canceled have been canceled because we just needed to, but some of them have been canceled, uh, canceled at the request of the Early Learning uh, Division. So be sure if there are any questions, do not be afraid to ask her. Um, and then next, um, I want to talk about the Ad Hoc Child Care Portal Committee that's been going on for the last few months through the Early Learning Division. Um, that was, and it's in the Office of Child Care. There are about, oh gosh, I want to say 20, 25 people on that committee. We are getting uh, closer to an endpoint on where they want to be. Uh, I think a final 
uh, decision of what will be um, given as far as recommendations will come in October. I have two of my law enforcement guys on that, um, Jerry Moore out of Salem and uh, Kevin Barton, the new DA out of Washington County. They've been very, very helpful in what uh, they view as what you can and cannot put on the portal, what should or shouldn't be on the portal. And then we've had an awful lot of input from child care providers, uh, people who are in the industry as far as what they would like to see. Um, the reality of the matter is the portal is kind of a mess. You have to go in two or three places if you're going to find child care. Uh, if you're looking for any problems, uh, who's got the best place to go, it really is not a very friendly portal. So hopefully by the end of the child care portal ad hoc committee, that's a mouthful too, um, we'll have a little better information, a little better idea of what will be on that portal. Questions on that that I can or can't answer, maybe. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next thing um, I'm going to go to is that, and this is um, uh, Prevent Child Abuse America Oregon is having a fundraiser in October, and I will send out an invitation for all of you. Hope that maybe you can come. It's on a Sunday, I think October 26th or 27th, whatever that Sunday is. $35, but PCA will have a special label, either white or red wine. And um, Congresswoman Elizabeth Furs, former Congresswoman, will be our main speaker. So we're pretty excited. Her ex-husband owns the winery, and they still do some running of it together, which has been an interesting conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so please come to that one. I'll get you the information. Then um, moving along to PCA America, uh, some of us are not here today because they are on a plane coming back from that conference, and I flew in last night from it. Their conference was titled Moving Upstream, so all of us here in Oregon have heard the uh, analogy of, you know, plucking the kids out of the river, you know, further down, and you got to go upstream. And several of us at the conference said, well, we love the analogy that maybe we need a new one because it's been around a long time and we've been talking kids for a long time. So we'll see what we come up with. Anyway, it was uh, very interesting. They introduced their new executive director, who is Dr. Melissa Merrick. She uh, is out of the Center for Disease Control. Young, very dynamic, very smart. Um, I just really enjoyed every interaction that uh, she had with, with the over a thousand people that were there. So I think she's going to be really dynamic with that organization So as they keep telling us back there. And Christy Peoples is one of our Oregon people who's a staff member. Just fasten your seatbelts. So let's see what, what comes out of them. One of the conversations from that, and I'm kind of getting out of order because I do have PCA conference down here at 2.45, but I'm, I'm the only one that, in the room that went. Um, so um, they, they're wanting to talk about home visiting more as a health care issue. And um, that several people in talking about it, they don't want to get away from the child abuse and neglect piece, but that it truly is a health care issue. And we've got health care people sitting at the table and I know they can probably tell you that, yeah, let's, that's a good idea, let's go there. But, it, but several of their sessions really focused on that and how um, Melissa talked about how we, you know, jumped off the cliff on Ebola and yet there were only about, I think what she said, about 10,000 people or something like that who um, really had Ebola issues. And then she went, well, but we have 2 billion kids in the world who are abused and neglected every day, and so how come we're not jumping off the cliff on this the same way? Um, I guess if you've been doing this for a while, you kind of have to ask the same question. So if they're going to take some of that leadership role, maybe we need to take some of that um, messaging and, and do some rephrasing as well. Now, my organization has kind of been on that bent for quite a while that you have to frame it in a different way light so that people do pay attention. That was my big takeaway from, from the conference. And then I'm going to pause for a minute. 
because you've got something. I do, and I don't know if this is the right time or not, yeah. but I did yeah. want to show you guys heard about this. Beautiful. Well, 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 well deserved. I've, I've known Martha or worked with Martha for I don't know, 12 years now, believe it or not, and 20 of these are deserved. Oh, wow. <laughs> For the people on the phone, can you read it? Oh, sure. So it's a beautiful award, Prevent Child Abuse America, Martha Brooks, 2019. Donna J. Stone Leadership Award. And it actually is a very beautiful award. Well, I haven't seen it a lot like this. Mm -hmm. Maybe I was in a pen. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, it's lovely. Oh, and it's got the pinwheel on it. Yeah. It does have the pinwheel. So, um, I'll give a little bit of background on this. Um, and I'll pass it this way so everybody can see it. And, and one of the reasons, I got home last night at 1.30 in the morning and I just ran out today with my bag and I just drug it out and I tried to find heavy and I got got here and I went, oh, I know why it is. So thank you for making me not look like I'm <laughs> posting. But um, well <laughs> but yeah, thank you. It is um the founders award that they give uh in uh honor in memory of their founder, uh, Donna J. Stone. And I received an email in 1st of July, and it was one of those, congratulations, you've been awarded, and you know, you get this this uh, semi, all expense paid trip to Milwaukee, and I'm going, well, that's a strange place, but okay. <laughs> And and then I'm thinking, you know, okay, where's the line down here that says send us five hundred dollars and then you get to go? And I just, <laughs> I just about deleted the email. I seriously. So then I said, well, maybe not, because it kind of looks official. So I sent it to um, Christy Peoples and I said, is this for real? And she emailed back and said yes. And Aaron's not on the phone yet or not here yet, but Aaron Dean nominated me. And I didn't know. So, um, <laughs> quite taken back. Um, I was allowed one minute. You know me, I took two. <laughs> and then the music started playing. Then, yeah, I asked everybody, I want to get the hook, and they go, no, you're not. And <laughs> the lady that received another award from Arizona, I mean, it was really a, a very West centric. Awards night, I mean, awards day, two days. They gave some on one day and, and others the next. Their um, supervisor was out of Arizona, too, that received the national award. So it was really a very West day for um, the awards. But, um, you know, besides thanking my family and Aaron and everybody, um, I made the Oregon folks stand up who were there, and we had a pretty good contingency. And I thank them because, and I'm telling you the same thing, um, that you don't do this work alone. And it takes a lot of people and a lot of hands. And so um, you're all a part of this. Is it just me? So we will now move along. Am I ahead of time? No. Okay. Um, so we're going to go first to a presentation um, from Beth. What does the community know about home visiting results of a household survey in rural Oregon? So um, Remy has got the uh, GoToMeeting hooked up. So those of you on the phone, if you're on the GoToMeeting, the slides are there. And we've got them in front of us here. They are also on um, the ELD website under Best Beginnings. So Beth Green, our yeah. super duper researcher out of Portland. I was say, I feel so alone over here in this part. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Uh, oh, and before you start, we have treats. I, I'm Playing Benjamin today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about this little piece of this project. 
Um, do you have a, or will you just, okay. So this is, if you want to just click forward, a project that I've been working on um, with uh, Christy Cox, who's on the line, and supporting, uh, um, yeah, 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 thank you. <laughs> the project supposed is broadly, I'm going to talk a little bit about the project background, and then we'll get to the piece that I'm really going to focus on today, which is the community awareness survey. Uh, but we've been working for the past say, three years um, in supporting the work uh, to develop home visiting systems in our southern Oregon and region, as well as in Skew County, California. You can see here we work with the South Central Early Learning Hub, South Coast Early Learning Hub, and uh, Skew County, California. Again, three very rural areas. You can go. Um, the project's big picture is to improve and strengthen the home visiting systems in those regions. Um, and the work has been happening in what we call our four buckets. And the buckets uh, have to do with strengthening internal communication, that is, communication within home visiting programs and across home visiting programs, um, and really broadly defined. So the people who participate in the governance structures, and each hub and region has its own governance structure, um, include sort of the key players that we think about, Healthy Families, Early Head Start, Nurse Family Partnership, and all the um, OHA funded home visiting, EIECSD, um, as well as others like CHS Home Visiting and other partners. So they're really broadly defined networks of home visiting models in those regions. Um, so communication, uh, shared intake and referral. So we have some really interesting pilots going on down there around doing a coordinated intake and referral process, um, which I think really is some great work there. And then also professional development and how do we create uh, both shared information around professional development so we can really make the most efficient use of those resources and offer them to everyone, um, but also sort of developing a shared regional professional development plan across different home visiting models. And then the fourth bucket, which we haven't actually, there hasn't been as much work done in this region or in this bucket, um, but the fourth one is just sort of trying to understand and strengthen and develop community awareness of home visiting and what it is and what parents think it is and how they might find out about it if they um, are interested. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. All right. So just to give you a sense of the, um, like how well this project is supported, um, again, call, huge call to Ford Family Foundation for recognizing that this kind of systems work doesn't happen without some serious investment of resources. So each region has a full-time or close to full-time uh, regional home visiting system coordinator who does all the coordination work across these buckets and manages a work plan across the four areas. Um, there's one meta coordinator who's Sacha Klein, whom I know, um, not Sacha Klein, um, Satya. Satya. Yeah, not yeah. Satya Klein, but Satya Klein. Mm -hmm. I always get her mixed up with Sasha Klein, and I'm like, is that really her last name? Mm -hmm. um, so Satya, I knew her first name, is <laughs> her last name, is our meta coordinator, and she coordinates the coordinators and keeps them on track and provides professional development. This has been wonderful. Um, in that role, and then we have really supportive program officer, <laughs> Christy Cox. Um, we have regional, there are regular regional meetings um, convened by the coordinators as well as cross-region convenings. We just had a big one um, where people come together and do a lot of shared learning. And then they fund, uh, Cal, uh, my colleague Callie and I to do evaluation support. And it's really been an extremely formative developmental evaluation. Um, so we have collected uh, a number of different kinds of data, which I'll talk about briefly. Um, and we also, Callie works with each of the regional coordinators to do PDSAs in their region around specific problems of practice or issues that they're having or wanting to work on. Um, and we see, we, they use lots of data. I, I always tell the story with somewhat of with pride, but it's the only meeting I've ever been to where we actually got like a wave when we presented data. Woohoo! <laughs> 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 data wave! <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, so in the fourth bucket, as I said, there hasn't been as much work being done in that bucket. Um, so the first thing we thought would be important was just to sort of learn more about what the community really thought about home visiting programs and what's available and how helpful they are. So we engaged a marketing research firm back in April and the marketing research firm, we wanted to have enough calls that we could provide the data out for a representative sample within each region. So they did 1,200 calls across all of the counties um, through a really incredible process, I have to say, I was amazed. <laughs> um, landlines and cell phones, and uh, the screener was a uh, person who were residents and 18 or older. So these are adults, right? So this is a survey of community members and what they think about and know about home visiting and how you use one like This is an important group to know about because they are the tax holder base. They are the voters. Mm -hmm. They are the people who can, you know, really make decisions through how they vote and what the kind of legislation they support. Um, and also, right? Okay. Next slide. All right, so just to give you a, an idea, we did have um, a number of calls, the number of calls that were completed for each county were proportional to the adult population in that county. And again, just a representative sample, um, kind of about 1,200 total. But there were some differences when we looked at the, the compared the demographics of who responds to these kind of phone surveys, which will not surprise you probably. <laughs> um, first, that the sample of respondents tended to be older. Um, there tend to be more women than men, 63% female. They tended to be more likely to be married than you might expect, given the demographics of those regions. Um, they tended to be uh, slightly higher in education, right? Um, there were somewhat fewer Latinx adults in the survey, um, even though we did offer the survey in Spanish, about 3% versus 8% overall. But interestingly, there were fewer white families or white adults than we would have expected by chance. So, and when we look at the demographics of the other um, persons of color, it's really kind of all over the place, but those percentages add up. There's Native American, there's African American, there's Asian, there's a lot of people who identified as multiple multiple races. Um, so that was interesting. Um, and we look, did look at differences, uh, even though the sample was small, for the overall sample between uh, white adults and persons of color, and did not find any significant differences between those two groups. Okay, so what did we learn? And you have a handout, actually, it's one of the handouts from today that has a very brief summary of the um, findings. It's like a few pages that we developed. Each of the regions got a much more detailed regional and county level report, which they like to use. Um, and there were some differences. Um, but basically, just to give you a sense of kind of what we learned, we found that um, overall, people who were current parents, so anyone parenting someone under 18, um, were generally more aware of home visiting programs. So those people who were actively parenting, about 40% of them were aware of home visiting. And we didn't ask them to use the word home visiting program. We used kind of a lengthy definition that we vetted quite a bit. Um, and I'll, I can just read it to you. It's yeah. on the handout. Um, so we said, um, voluntary home-based family support programs um, called early childhood home visiting. Those that offer family voluntary visits from a provider like a nurse or a parenting educator to assist them when expecting a child or up to the fifth birthday. These programs are offered to families at no cost and usually take place in families' homes on a weekly or monthly basis over a period of one or more years. These are voluntary home-based programs for families to partner with them on child development and parenting. So that was what we provided to them as a frame. So when I say home visiting, this is what we're referring to. Um, wait, can you go back? Oh, sorry. 
So in terms of whether they had actually used the home visiting program, about 24, 25% of parents had, which was interesting, um, and about 15% of the overall sample. And then about a third, 36 to 38% uh, said that they know where to go to learn more. We're gonna come back to this question about um, available programs, home visiting programs in their area. All right. There were a few differences in terms of subgroups that we looked at. Um, so perhaps unsurprisingly, also like parents, the younger adults tended to be more knowledgeable about home visiting, knew kind of were aware of them. Um, women also tended to be more aware of them. And interestingly, although not surprisingly, the adults with higher education tended to be more aware of these programs than those with um, just a GED or less. Which is interesting when you think about that's like a primary, or not a primary, but at least part of the target population that's less aware. Yeah, um, Sherry. Uh, did you, did you, did the survey ask how they knew about it? Or you okay there, okay. Um, okay, overall, one of the key findings, the key takeaways was really that almost everybody felt like these services would be really useful. And we asked some specific questions about useful in different ways. Um, so when they were asked about, when they were asked the question, many parents could use um, support, <laughs> learning about how to support children's healthy development, um, almost 90% said yes, that they, that they agreed with that. Um, and this is person who agreed or strongly agreed. Okay. Um, when asked how many, whether parents, they felt parents could use support around how to use effective parenting skills, again, over 80%. Um, and really no big differences between current parents and non-current parents. So community-wide really reflected a high level of support that these um, parents could use support in these areas. Um, and then in terms of the item we looked at, voluntary parenting education will be a useful service for families in my community. We did see a slight difference there with parents saying they felt that would be more useful, but not huge, right? It's still 83% in the overall population. Um, so a pretty overwhelming level of support for this idea of parents need support. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of how helpful they thought, they would be, and actually these are, can you go to the next one? Okay, go back, sorry. Um, in terms of how helpful they thought, there were some, again, subgroups with, again, women feeling like these kinds of parenting supports would be more helpful or beneficial um, compared to men, and again, people with higher education feeling like these kinds of parenting supports would be more helpful or beneficial overall. Beth, do you have an idea? If that those these same questions were asked in a more um, metropolitan area, if the men would respond differently, or? I have no idea. That's a really good question. I mean, part of the part of the reason for doing this, I mean, these communities are very rural, right? Um, and I think that you'd have to do a survey in a metropolitan area to find out. It would be very interesting to know. Um, and I'm wondering, was there any description of like the target population for these services? Just trying to get a sense for like that higher education group. Are they thinking like, I don't know, pejoratively like, oh yeah, low income families could definitely use more support or was it just across? We tried to ask across the board, and we tried to specifically not describe the programs as okay. targeting specific okay. any specific population. Mm -hmm. So the general consensus is that no matter what the, the home visiting program, home visiting was viewed as positive and helpful. Parenting supports provided through home visiting, yeah. Okay, cool. And we asked a variety of questions about other benefits of home visiting, including things like health for children and things like that. And there were huge differences across the different kinds of health. 
Um, and so then we asked about what barriers would you have um, if there was, if you were to have a home visitor or if you were offered a home visiting opportunity to participate in a program like this. Um, and here, this is a lot on this slide, I realize. So the, the bars that are green are the parents um, and the bars that are blue are the overall. And then the darker bars, whether it's green or blue, are the percentage of families who said, this would be a big reason why I wouldn't participate. And the lighter bars are, this would be a, a smaller reason that I wouldn't participate. And you can see, I mean, overall, if you look just down the line, it's somewhere between 25 to 30 percent said that at least some of these would be a, at least a small reason why I might not choose to participate. Um, but there are some differences uh, for current parents and overall. So if you even look at that first one, um, current parents were less likely to say they would feel uncomfortable with a family support provider coming into the house um, than over the overall population. So, and they all, so but they were more likely to say that they would have, they would have, it would be a small reason. So it's hard to know exactly what that says, but at least it says it's not a huge problem for parents. About 23% said, yeah, that'd be, that would be a problem. I would really feel uncomfortable with that. Um, in terms of, I feel like I have, overall, I have enough support. That was total the highest, most frequent reason barrier that we saw, um, which is interesting if you think mm -hmm. about doing, you know, triage kind of universal home visiting, how many families might kind of accept that first home visit, but then say, you know what, I'm really fine. Um, we do see that in healthy families. That's a really big reason why people don't, um, but the biggest one in healthy families is the next one, which is I'm too busy, <laughs> um, which also is fairly high, about 25% overall, uh, with parents, interestingly, saying mm -hmm. that was a bigger reason. It's mm -hmm. surprising, because if you're parenting, <laughs> wait, guess what? You're busier having just lost my daughter to college, and like all of a sudden, now all the time. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Hopefully now it's 30. <laughs> Um, I would feel negatively judged. I think this is one we also talk about um, quite a bit, that I don't want someone coming to my house because they would judge me. Um, and about 25%, kind of across the board, said that was a barrier, at least a small or a large barrier. Um, and then this was interesting. I thought that parents really didn't feel like family support providers wouldn't be able to understand my family's needs would be a barrier. So they felt like they probably would understand my family, or at least it's only a small barrier in terms of like letting someone in, like it might be something different for me, or they wouldn't get where I was coming from. Um, relatively small barrier of overall. So okay, but if you go back, but yeah. the, but being a small barrier, it, it was big. quite it was yeah. quite big. about a third. Right? Yeah. So there's definitely barriers to be overcome. I think yeah. that's the message here. Yeah. Um, and so thinking about messaging and how people get offered these services mm -hmm. is obviously really important. And Beth, I was wondering um, that I would feel negatively judged and in, in using you know, that you know, uh, implied by the home visitor. Um, I, was that explicitly what it was, or is it judged by my neighbors who see that somebody's coming to my house, or, or my, my, my mother-in-law who now thinks I'm not a good mother, or other, other sources of judgment. <laughs> yeah. Just as I would feel negatively judged. Okay. So it could be any of those. <laughs> this was a, like, Six minute phone survey. So we, we had a hard time, trust me, narrowing it down. Um, it was right, you always have more questions. Mm -hmm. yeah, makes you have more questions. <laughs> um, yeah, all right, so you can go to the next slide. This one has to do with where would you go? One question on this, though, before oh, yeah, you yeah, yeah. So, were they allowed to say only one reason, or could they do multiple reasons? We asked for each reason how big of a barrier would this be? Okay, for each of those. A small reason, a big reason, or no reason at yes. all. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So you already gave these these categories. Yeah. So we said 
Um, if you had an infant or a toddler, were there any reasons why you wouldn't participate um, in home-based family support and parenting coaching? For each of these, tell me if this would be a big reason, a small reason, or not at all a reason. And then we read through the list. Um, and then we asked them, I'll just read you the questions since I have it right here. If you or someone you knew wanted to find out more about the types of early childhood home visiting supports available in your community, would you know where to go? So we saw that already. And then if they did know where to go, which 36%, then they would know where to go, which is low. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, this is what they said. So this is of those who said they would know where to go. Yes, I would ask someone I know within a community agency, which I thought was interesting that that was the highest mm -hmm. one. So maybe these are people who are already connected with services in some way. Um, I would talk to a family member or a friend with second highest. That didn't surprise me. Uh, online search also didn't surprise me. Um, look in a local publication, which is interesting, and I also think speaks to maybe the rural mm -hmm. setting that those local publications, having lived in a small town, that weekly that you get, it's like your town that has like, who went to whose house and what you know, <laughs> right. they had. Um, those are really widely spread, widely used. Um, and Christy, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that at all. No? Okay. Not right now. All right. <laughs> Look on social media. So we see some, some of these programs are using Facebook and those kinds of things, so about half. And then we asked about 2 on one info, and not too many people reported using that, but a few, one in five overall. Um, so I think that's all that I put together for today. Um, was there any questions from anybody on the phone? I haven't stopped to ask you that directly. All right, any questions from anyone on the room? And I think it's a it's an interesting snapshot mm -hmm. as we think about especially things like moving forward with universal home visiting and thinking about perceptions of home visiting and what people think about it. Um, and also, I think provides some interesting information about how you can get that information out to people and the fact that many people, most people, wouldn't really know where to go to get more information about that. I thought that was kind of a key takeaway. Um, and do we, I don't remember. Oh. So Kate stepped out, but yeah. I think um, at least what I kind of glean out of this <clears throat> is that people are open to getting support, but they are uncomfortable with what that might mean. They're not super comfortable. I, the, the percentage who said there was some barrier, if you add those together, like mm -hmm. that's the big barrier and little barrier, it's usually somewhere between like 50 to 60 yeah. percent um, experiencing some level of uncomfort. Comfort. So um, the key to, I think, the home visiting, and I think Universal might help that, is that we're trying to normalize what's happening. That it isn't just for certain people. Um, and I always go back to the, you know, child abuse does not look at your checkbook, but we look an awful lot at who we serve by looking at their checkbook. If we can normalize this through universal home visiting to do the referrals to the more intensive, then maybe some of those barriers, barriers will start to shrink as people realize this is not for one particular group of people. Right. That's right out of this. Christy, do you have anything to add since that's Yeah, yeah. I just, sure, I, I, I have quite a few things that are on my mind, but um, first just wanted to thank Beth and Kelly for pulling this together and pulling it off. I think it was a, a little bit of a daunting task and also thanks to this group for um, giving it some audience. I think it probably does have some um, statewide probably interest, maybe around the universal home visiting, but maybe also just in general for early learning hubs and um, other organizations that are trying to do outreach. I, the biggest takeaway for me was the 36% knew where to learn more, or 38, whichever group you're looking at. That to me seems way too low. We've got lots of work to do there just to make sure people know where to turn to help. So that's, that's my biggest takeaway. 
But one of the other things that I just lay out in terms of contextual part of this project and why community awareness of those buckets that were up on earlier slides is kind of one of the last ones that we are attending to and that we really see this um, phone research um, plus anecdotal information that we have from our communities as being baseline information about you know, what communities know about and um, understand about community awareness before trying to launch some big campaign. Um, because I think there's some, or at least for my part, for sure, there's concern about doing a big community awareness campaign about home visiting and really there not being a lot more spots for families to offer. And so I think um, one of the things that our project is really starting to focus on this, this year in particular is, you know, what happens when families come into a program from whatever door, whether it's through the shared intake and referral process or whether it's through just kind of a regular through the door of an agency, what happens when they're either not eligible for that home visiting program or there's no room for them, there's not a, a spot for them and they're on a wait list or in some other way not able to be served. So we're really trying to attend to that question of like what are we doing as a community or as a region to support those families that either are not eligible or on a wait list. So before we go with the big community awareness push, we're trying to figure out how to make sure that families get some kind of support, whether it's community-based parenting education or other sort of referrals to, to programming resources. <coughs> Sherry, Christy, I, if I could just, I, I don't have a question exactly, but I just wanted to open up the opportunity for you to respond. Um, um, it, 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 what, to what degree or where do you see uh, um, the characteristics of rural communities really, really shining through on this, and 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 maybe more specifically, what barriers? You know, this this looked at knowledge and attitude. What what barriers do you, living in those communities, do you feel are are barriers that are that are characteristic of rural small communities? It, in terms of what what piece, Jared, Sherry? In terms of in terms of building greater um, knowledge and and uh, attitudes and, and ultimately behavior uh, toward uh, home visiting programs in rural areas. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I would say it's just kind of probably a lack of a concerted effort. Um, that would be my my main read, and then there's no one silver you know bullet for getting communities to know about things. They so use all of the above. You know, any type of outreach that is listed here as ways that people find out about things, but using all the different ways of outreach. But I just I think in general there hasn't been a real concerted effort, um, at least in the Oregon communities, to use a little bit different um, around really making sure that the community at large, not just parents with young children, know about what's available and know how to access it. So that's my that's my general response, but I'd be, love to hear from others who are on the phone in rural communities. Uh, I'm looking, Christine, unless they're on the phone, you've got pretty much Portland, Salem, Yamhill, Well, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to, I don't have a comment about that, but when you were looking at the data and you said the white versus the Latinx, we're noticing that we're seeing the larger numbers, more of our families checking white because then you don't drill down. Oh. Anyway, I, Did you hear that, Christy? No, it would be helpful if she could repeat it or someone closer to the phone could repeat it. This, I'll see if I can project my mother voice. There you go. <laughs> okay. Um, I was saying that uh, I, I noticed on the, the data about more white than Latino or Latinx, and we just noticed in this last year that we're starting to see more white in our uh, services, even though they're about the same. And we think that our families are just checking white and don't go to the Hispanic or non-Hispanic category because they don't want to be identified. So we didn't ask oh. it way where it's Hispanic, non-Hispanic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How 
we do identify your race, ethnicity, and then we respond to the face or we circle. Yeah. That, right? So we're just mm -hmm. because people are trying trying yeah. to be low profile. Well, that, I mean, I think that's true. I mean, I feel like that's a, probably a good explanation, at least in part, for the low response rate mm -hmm. among us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we did offer. Yes. Spanish. Um, anyway, just as a. They don't want to. They don't want to draw any attention to themselves at all or have any record that somebody could possibly use to get to them. Yeah. Yeah. And understandably so, because those mechanisms have been used. So. Well, they're being threatened. Right? Yes. 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 Okay. I actually have one more question. Right. One more question. Um, and then we'll go to Sherry. Oh, no, I'm going to um, break down it all by those who have reported having used a home home visiting services. Like, were their answers any different? No, but we have, we could. We could do that because, like, I think 20% or something had, oh, no, it was, small, it was smaller than that. 20% knew about home visiting and something really. So 8%. Yeah. yeah. 8% of 1,200 is. That's probably big enough. We might like 100. Like, it'd be interesting. That would be really interesting to do, actually. Yeah, like yeah. the barriers right. in particular. Like, how much do they list these as a barrier having yeah. participated? That's a great follow up. And we were yeah. Really about 1,200. 1,200 exactly, actually. <laughs> okay. All right. Super. We look for more, Beth, from yeah. from the questions we've asked. Uh, if you can kind of ferret some of that out. Okay. Um, and that information again is on the web as well as should have come in your email. Okay. So now we're going to go to another presentation, which I. Thank you for interrupting. It's the Convention on Rights of the Child, CRC. And Sherry and I had a conversation about this hmm, a month ago, maybe. Uh -huh. Time flies here. And um, she informed me of something that I didn't know. And so I think this would be interesting for us to hear and to consider. So, Sherry, you want to talk about uh, the UN and, and the CRC? Sure. And um, is it possible to project the um, uh, the other document related to this? This this document is a is a, an abbreviated um, uh, version of of the articles. Uh, but then there's yeah, then there's this one yeah yeah. And, uh, this is the draft, so <laughs> oh, that's really scrambled. Um, so the convention on the rights on. There you go. The Convention on the Rights of the Child. Which, which document? So this is Christy. Which document are you looking at, Sherry? I'm which looking at the one list? that says United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child on the upper right-hand column, and and this uh, kind of graphic of a cartoon of children standing around the world. Thank you. History. Okay. Yeah. On the left, it's history. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the Convention on the Rights of the Child is a is a is a uh, um, human rights document uh, uh, from the United Nations that's actually been around for quite a while. It was ten years in the making, uh, and then in 1990 the United Nations passed it. the 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 document is intended to uh, uh, outline what are the basic human rights for child well-being. Uh, and uh, and it, there were many, many countries' voices involved in this. The United States was a strong voice in, in, in uh, formulating this document. Uh, and it, um, it really had, it really brought forward that the focus on children and the rights that children need to have to have quality life and, and um, uh, health and well-being. It um, uh, has been uh, ratified by uh, every member of the United Nations except the United States, uh, and it's yeah, which is quite remarkable. Uh, and I'll, I'll I'll touch on what um, yeah yeah we can stand out on that one. Uh, we're very outstanding in that regard. Um, it's it's uh, there are four core principles. The first is non-discrimination. 
Uh, the second is um, uh, devotion to the best interest of the child. Uh, and the third is uh, right to life survival and development. And the fourth is respect for the views of the child. Uh, so that's it, it, on the surface, doesn't sound very controversial. It, mm -hmm. it, it, it is, and it truly is very basic. And what I really like about it is, it, it really is a a cross cultural, cross cross international voice uh, on capturing what are the basic essentials for child well being, uh, and puts them in the form of rights for children. Uh, so it, um, uh, the CRC, uh, I'm just going to read the bullets here. The CRC protects and promotes the rights of children worldwide to participate in family, cultural, and social aspects of life, the right to survival, development, and protection against abuse, neglect, and exploitation, uh, the right to education, health care, and juvenile justice system, uh, and the right to children with disabilities. So there again, it just seems so, it just resonates with, wow, it's, it's nice to see all this in one document, uh, but no surprise, this, 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 it's, unless someone disagrees, it, it does, there's nothing there that is, is, is exceptionally out there. It's, it's really basic. Um, so if you could scroll down on this same document, please. So it, it was it, the United Nations ratified it in 1990, and then it went out for ratification. And just uh, in the last, I want to say, four years, the there were uh, the United States was stood alone with Somalia. Somalia was not able to ratify because it didn't have an uh, intact government to to be able to do that. Uh, as soon as they did, they did ratify it. So now the United States stands alone. Um, uh, so uh, a quote from the website, uh, human rights, including rights for children, are basic standards to which every person is entitled to survive and develop in dignity. So, Sorry, yeah. Do you know why the U.S. is standing? Yeah. Sure. Um, let's go down to what <laughs> Sorry, I, I, yield. I, I, and, yeah, let's just, just do it. It yells in the room. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. So I, I, um, I, I quickly pulled together some of the uh, common arguments that you hear, and that's what those. So the opposition to U.S. ratification um, expresses concerns for parental rights. They feel like the, giving children rights takes away parental rights. When, in fact, if you look at the document, it's not hard to find many references to parents as a, as a very important component of children's rights. Um, so it's, um, it's a hypersensitivity to something that really doesn't, doesn't, doesn't hold water. Mm -hmm. well, maybe sometimes hold water. they should be. I mean, <laughs> well, that's the <laughs> against abuse and neglect. And it, it words that very carefully, that, you know, that, but, but you know, yeah. weighing both sides. But that's a good point. That mm -hmm. Donald is saying that, that sometimes children do need to be taken away from their parents mm -hmm. um, uh, because that is in the best interest of the child. Right. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, if the best interest of the child is to be with their parents. Mm -hmm. right? and, that, and it clearly outlines that in multiple points in yes. that document. It's, I read that. It's really good. Um, sure, and you and I had a conversation, though, that um, when Bill Clinton was president, that he at least acknowledged. Yeah, Madeleine Albright uh, did sign it. She did oh. sign it, and the next step is for uh, the president, at that time it was Bill Clinton, to bring it to, to present it to Congress for ratification. Uh, no president, Bill Clinton onward, have done that. Uh, the, the best support that the, the CRC has received was from uh, Obama when he said that it's outrageous that we haven't ratified it, and he promised to bring it before Congress, but that didn't happen. So, yeah, another opposition is uh, that uh, uh, opposition to U.S. ratification argues that the U.N. is an elitist institution <laughs> and uh, as such should not be trusted to <laughs> properly handle uh, sensitive decisions regarding family issues. The response, if you could scroll down, my re this is my response <laughs> to this. <laughs> my response to this is that CRC builds on and parallels human rights documents preceding it, human rights treaties that the U.S. has ratified. All people should have basic human rights, including and especially children. 
And then a third common argument is uh, that the U.S. ratification, uh, they have concern, the opposition has concerns about the juvenile justice system and life imprisonment uh, laws currently in place. Uh, so, so the laws that the U.S. has toward juveniles, you know, trying them as an adult, and the punishments that they get, and as you probably know, that children tried as, as adults get um, uh, convictions and punishments more severe than adults do tried under it as an adult. So, um, and, but an, another another approach to this, besides saying, well, maybe children shouldn't be treated the way they are in the judicial mm -hmm. system, is that the Supreme Court also says that. And there have been multiple decisions and very within the last 10 to 15 years that have reversed some of the, the laws that uh, apply to juveniles, to children in the judicial system because they were unconstitutional. Yeah, they're still looking at that. Yeah. yeah, there's still work that needs to be done. Yeah. So I I I I I feel like that uh, I I I found my growth in this is this when I went into medicine this was my goal for the youth to get the U S to ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Child. I was very naive, <laughs> <laughs> and and then and then I uh, taught a university course um, for a while. Uh, on the CRC specifically in the graduate program at University of New Mexico, and I and I shifted somewhat, and I said, this is a fabulous document. This is a guide, and this could be that this could be what informs and kind of helps us check in what are we doing, you know, what are the policies, what are the where are we investing, and how does it fit with with the, the child well being as defined by the the C R C and I and I the class that I taught was um within it was in the uh, Masters of Public Health program and what I said is that just because the US hasn't ratified it doesn't mean we can't use it. And so and so a deep dive into what it is and how it can be applied to uh, decisions that are made in terms of uh population health, uh specifically for children and parents. Uh, and and now I've come to um, uh, think that I would love for the U.S. to ratify it, but U.S. not ratifying it does not it stop any state from ratifying it. That is an option. And so my call is for a discussion about um, uh, if and how Oregon uh, might ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Oh yeah, <laughs> I think it's a good idea. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I was wondering where um, the, the who where who called the UN an elitist institution? That's in quote. Do you remember where that was from? That I don't. I don't. It wasn't even cited. Um, oh. I just pulled this off the off the. Yeah, yeah. It, I think the quote was 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 a a um, a phrase, a a, a mindset, a, a label, oh, okay. rather than just being something that was that was actually a, someone speaking. Yeah, and yeah, it yeah. Be... So this concept of elitist institution um, in, among primarily conservative um, leaning um, folks is, is that they don't know about us, we know best about us, and, and they shouldn't have a voice in how we function. So, and so I have one more follow-up question. Um, so I am entering the world of education and children's health. Um, I, so this has been a debate that's been going on since the Clinton era. So, I guess I just don't understand why. Uh, <laughs> it's a really long time. <laughs> well, it waxes and wanes. Uh huh. You know, it's there have been times when it really has gotten some attention, uh, and then you know, right now, you know, people don't even know about it. So it does wax and wane. Why it didn't, you know, get hold and and be ratified? Um, uh, several at several opportunities uh, is 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 you know that that concern that that uh in in American culture that parent rights 
uh, supersede children's rights and that, that children's rights um, would displace parental rights. But it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's really a, an unjustified fear. It's a fear, I think. So, Sherry, I have a question. This is Rebecca Collette, for those of you on the phone. Um, I'm just curious, based on the position of Best Beginnings as well as the people at the table, what might be some of those first steps in moving this for the state to kind of take a look at and adopt. Do you want to speak to that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Our advocates in the room. <laughs> yeah. um, so my thought process on this is that it's uh, multifaceted. I mean, first, information has to be disseminated, and we have to get uh, people to understand what the CRC is. And that in and of itself starts basically right here with Sherry um, sharing with us as to what it is, what the process has been, what the downfall is, and yet here we in Oregon have an opportunity if we want to, to uh, support and ratify the CRC by Oregon. Um, your next steps are then obviously legislative, gubernatorial, uh, in that process, which there are enough organizations or even somebody such as the Early Learning Council taking on the mantle of saying we would like to see the CRC passed. But that would have to be a rather uh, larger, longer conversation. I don't think it's something that, you know, you do in 10 minutes and, oh yeah, wham, it's done. Or as Sherry said, the UN would have had the U.S. on board already. However, Oregon has had a precedent, a long precedent, of being out of the box um, or thinking out of the box before anybody else does. And Okay, the marijuana issue. We've had legalized marijuana to some extent in this state since um, I want to say late, teen, late 1970s, early 1980s, and then now we're one of the three West Coast states along with Colorado and a few others who have legalized that. Then you look at our stand on assisted suicide. We were one of the first states there. So it's not unprecedented for Oregon to be a leader in this realm. So um, the next step past that is that we would have to find, I think, some other supporting organizations, ally organizations who would look at the CRC and push the legislature. So it is a big campaign, but it's not uh, unprecedented. It's not something that I don't think if possible. Can we do it in a short session coming up? No, but I think we could, um, depending on what we want to do, push it. Miriam's coming at uh, 2.45 or a little earlier, and maybe this is a question we ask her in our conversation of, okay, you want new and innovative things to go to the Early Learning Council, or you want to know what we think of how you can push things, this might be the question, one of the questions. Mm -hmm. So, how? Okay. I was going to say, it seems like with the Student Success Act, that this would be a good thing to support that. I mean, even if you didn't go into all the articles, if you identified the four basic principal rights of children, right. that that would be a biggie. And they they aren't uh, earth shattering. I mean, non discrimination, that's basic. And best interest of the child. I mean, right. those four are, those would be pillars to build on. Well, and I think, right, if in alignment with what you're saying about the Student Success Act, one of the three pillars is equity. I know ODE has adopted a pretty strong equity vision stance and, right, is thinking about how could we, if, if nothing else, to start embed this as the support to that equity stance, um, given that the majority of the organizations here have that as a part of their vision and mission is to and to support kids. 
Um, the, so to ratify in a state means to pass legislation? Mm -hmm. To do what? What does that mean? Right, the process of what you Yeah, I mean, is yeah. it out of the middle? Um, it, uh, I'd, I'd like a better conversation with the legislator who we would ask mm -hmm. to carry it. Yeah. It could be as easy as just a continuing resolution mm -hmm. um, or a joint resolution on okay. the floor of the House and the Senate. Okay, like we have for like trauma and mm -hmm. some of the other pieces. Yeah. Okay. So this is there something about rights to the child that we have something like that already in Oregon? We, we have the Bill of Rights for children for uh, children of incarcerated parents. That's it. Right. Okay. But that's I mean it's pretty, pretty narrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's but that's a really it's good a precedent. Yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I, I thought yeah. we had something on foster kids too. But again, they're narrow, specific, right? And this is the broad, right? All children should have rights. Mm -hmm. And it's quite comprehensive too. When you look at their articles, you know, it's it's it hits all the really yeah. really high points: the education, health, um, uh, housing, identity. Mm -hmm. The first one, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, in some countries that's a huge issue, mm -hmm. and it's becoming more of an issue here too. Sure. Uh, and but then it talks about green space and you know the opportunities to be outdoors and that spiritual life and you know it's quite comprehensive. That hits everything that we have. Yeah, you know, it's, I mean, it's, yeah. it's going back good. to other like landmarks, the bottle bill, um, right. making mm -hmm. all of Oregon a beach of public. I mean, all of the public property. I mean, all of those sort of mirror what you just sort of described. Yeah. Yeah. For broad statewide support of children in yeah. general, because like this is we have so much traction yeah. right now in gubernatorial leadership and yeah. legislative yeah. leadership. Good. It's an opportune moment to build upon. Right. right. So I will ask the question because we have a few minutes um, leeway here. Um, you want to have this discussion with Miriam a little bit too? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. All right, we can do that. Anybody on the phone have any comments? Do we still have you all? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, just no comments. Okay. <laughs> still here. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we'll we'll bring this up because I mean basically what one of our okay, we could make this one of our recommendations today is that the, the new early learning council mm -hmm. needs to consider um, uh, accepting the uh, CRC and pushing for legislation on it. I mean we'd have to kind of draft it that way, but. Um, if you want more time to think about it, we can do that. But we could make that as a recommendation. Yeah. It seems like it's a different organizational head to avoid the children's cabinet that all come together with that recommendation. That seems like a logical oh, way for that to yeah. come into fruition, right? Yeah. So right. Yeah. We've got all of those leaders within all of those various organizations, yeah. the RHA, DHS, yeah. ODE, you know, all these places. Like, right. This is a head that the way to say yes. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the, I think, the body that really it should go to. Yeah, yeah. That's, the first, yeah. it's got the governor, it's got legislative representation, mm -hmm. it's got um, stakeholder leadership. Right. At that right. table. Like broader mm -hmm. for you know, the, the population. Right. right. So maybe so, that's our recommendation is that let's go to that committee. So the ELC pass it up to the Children's, Children's Cabinet. Children's yes. Cabinet. Mm -hmm. to make that recommendation. Yeah. So when Miriam comes. Right. Well, it's, it gives a good, strong foundation for what we're trying to do in a coordinated, collaborative approach. Because mm -hmm. when you talk about the child, it talks, like you said, across various areas <laughs> the family mm -hmm. um, okay so let me um, I'm gonna feel on this before we 
we're going to have a conversation with her about this. Is there anybody opposed? Maybe I should ask the right way. All those in favor of saying to Miriam when she arrives here that we would like to recommend that the Early Learning Council um, refer the CRC to the Children's Cabinet for consideration. Of adoption. Of adoption. Oh, that's on the chair. Oh, and mm -hmm. Sue Miller is on the Children's Cabinet, too. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. The chair of the council. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, all those in favor of that? Say yes. It's on the phone. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, and everybody in the room? Yes. 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 I'm not voting for protocol's sake. <laughs> I'm a staffer. I got it. Come on. That's <laughs> fine. Right. <laughs> keep in mind that. That's right. Anybody opposed? Does anyone not have a heart? <laughs> <laughs> I will say, um, I'm in, uh, I spend a lot of time in the job and CCO world. Every time you see CRC, you think coal and rectal cancer. <laughs>
Baker Lalau work together or Baker Mall here and have two contracts over there. But my, I don't know what will come. Is Building Healthy Family is a nonprofit? I'm not familiar with that work. It didn't work. Um, yes. It's a community based organization. Okay. Yeah, I don't know that. Well, these three counties even have different time zones. Yeah. I mean, yeah. But they're all they're all in very different states. I mean, yeah. Wallowa County is relinquished all of their public health. Like, I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot going on in this place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. And the distance is such a... Yeah. Yeah. It's awful. Yeah. Three counties alone are, well, small. Figures bigger than several they, states. They go from north to south. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, from the yeah. mall here, if you were to put it in the size of states, I think it comes in like at 25th. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. So... Um, I, have a, then, I have a question. Two others. Yes, ma'am. Do you know whether um, Aaron and the Early Learning Division are open to reconsidering the service delivery areas that were predefined by the state? I thought you were talking That's about That's an that. excellent question, and no, I don't know. Um, Margaret, the conversation I had with Aaron on Tuesday about um, We'll allow a Baker Mall here uh, was a statement I made about um, allowing two contracts. So I don't know how they feel about it. I know that some of the people that were very insistent on having the contract with a one in each hub. They are no longer on the Early Learning Council or in the Early Learning Division. So I don't know if that thinking has changed. Um, you've got the Early Learning Director coming in a few minutes. Put that on your list to ask her. Okay. It just seems that I mean, it's really unusual for a program to say, I don't want to keep doing this, or an organization to say, I don't want to keep operating this program. And it seems like it, war it warrants a deeper dive as to what all's going on. And Martha, I think you're, you're raising that issue about the region seems to me to be um, like that could very well be a, a, a factor in their decision and something that, especially because of the way those decisions were made, kind of a top down rather than community driven. So it seems like there should be some way for them to take a look at that and see whether it, um, another approach might be have better outcomes for kids and families. Well, yes and no. If I'm there not, are, there are places in the state, this is Beth Marguerite, where like Coos Curry, I mean, I think they've had five providers in the last five years. It just mm -hmm. keeps churning. Oh wow. Yeah. I think. I mean, we have company, and we operated it for a long time, and just could not pencil it out any longer and had to and turn it over to a, a nonprofit and that they're doing a great job with it. But like it wasn't about the program, it was about the financial component of us we did it right. I mean not to say that that's not an issue in Eastern right. Oregon because yeah that, sure. that is crazy. All of it was an issue. Well and it, it was probably an issue in more of of the contract areas than we really realized. Um, I remember a year ago had a conversation with somebody out of Multnomah who said, if you can't get more money for X, we're going to have to let it go back. Now that's one of your big ones. And this was after we increased the money that we have for the program. That's, okay. The staff? Yes. You can't compensate your staff very well. <laughs> the kind of funds that come in, I think that's the biggie. And I wonder again about the limit on the indirect yeah. piece of it, yeah. too, for especially some of our nonprofit organizations. So we want to have that conversation with Miriam too. Sure, why not? Grammy's <laughs> <laughs> texting Miriam. Don't come. <laughs> <laughs> I think so that what this exemplifies is that from this committee you get some community perspective yeah. that you may not get otherwise. Uh -huh. That's a, you know, one question generates another because people are in the community.
community and see the others. Well, and can we offer some of the solutions for no. that? Okay. All right. Erin, thanks for your Martha? Yes, ma'am. Go, Marguerite. I'm I, at some point. At some point, I'm going to be ha I'm going to have to jump off of the call. So if I don't participate in that conversation with Miriam and somebody else, don't be don't be waiting for me to bring something up because I may not be here anymore. Got it. Okay, I got it. Okay. So fourth on Erin's report are new grant agreements for all sites. She's except for Eastern Oregon. To have uh, will begin on. 10-1 of 2019, uh, she's got a much better handle on grant agreements than she did the first time we did it, so it's a lot easier. This should roll over very nicely. At least that's what I'm being told and I'm hoping for. And then her last uh, thing on her report is this fall, she'll be issuing an RFA for the second QATA specialist that she has a little bit of money for. So that's the last thing. I will tell you one disappointment that I've had that's not on her report is that with all the new money, and there's not a lot for uh, HFO, two million out of the uh, continuing budget and two million coming from student success, but they won't see any of that for a while. It takes a while to get that money in. So it'll be second year of the biennium. Um, the Early Learning Division is not giving any more staff to HFO. They're continuing with what they have. Okay. Any questions with her report? And that last bit was not on her report. That was mine. Okay. Martha, now I had one. Martha. Yep. I had one other sure. question. There was a handout that came with one of the emails about the meeting that talked about um, a new HFA approach regarding serving families with child welfare involvement, but I didn't see it in Erin's report. Is that up for discussion at some point or more information? Yeah, good question. That was an attachment. Um, yeah, the adaptation of the program model. Uh, did that come from Erin? I think um, it did come from Erin, yeah. So, Marguerite, uh, without having her here to discuss that, and I will be honest, I missed that. Um, I, I didn't catch it in the emails that were going around. So, um, defer that until we can get to Erin. Perfect. Okay. All right. Okay, then we're going to go to, is Benjamin teed up or are you going to go? Um, if he's not on the phone, I can just give a quick highlight. But okay. Benjamin, are I, you there? I did. I did just join. Actually, I thought hey, it was going to be late. I, <laughs> um, hey, Marguerite, I think that was... we're, we're always five minutes late on my agenda. <laughs> Perfect. And I thought it was going to be late, but I, I really felt like I needed to stay in the room because there was somebody that was suggesting that all of the family first kids that eligible candidacy be court involved. And I, I had to make it clear that the uh, currently approved clearinghouse models are all based on a foundation of voluntary service. So, um, and, and prevention. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so I was glad I was there to make that comment. So, um, in terms of what we have going on for McBee, we had our advisory committee this morning and, um, you know, did quick highlights on needs assessment and um, where things stand with universally offered home visiting, which uh, Kate's there and uh, probably easier to hear her talk about that if people have additional questions and I can no longer see the whole agenda. But um, really our conversation this morning had to do uh, with two things. One, and they were both more, I would consider initial uh, they were seeds for additional conversation in, a, in our future uh, about um, we have a diversified administration of our home visiting programs and that's actually sort of growing with uh, DHS now having a stake in the potential for in-home or home visiting services. And I think there's a strength to that in terms of building the tent and building the um, strength in numbers and across systems. Um, so 
So we have now that future challenge of what are we as a system that is a component or a service array within a comprehensive early childhood service system. So our touch points with other services. And so, you know, that, that sort of age old question of, uh, we have different models and people should take pride in that and the different models have different areas of focus um, and collectively what are we and how are we a family support system so we really uh, short change i short i'll own it i short changed the time we really just planted the seed of that conversation some things emerged of you know do we have a good visual of how this comes together so a good challenge for me it was requested before by pamela heisler so nice reminder for me um, and then the other component was Carrie had wanted to reach out to the group um, and talk about those opportunities for professional development um, that we share. Um, and I gave an example. We, you know, uh, from time to time, the idea of having a statewide home visiting uh, conference comes up. That isn't something that, that we could support individually. So if that is something, A, it would have to be uh, a collective will, all, all sort of systems and agencies would need to collaborate on bringing that to fruition. But that was just one example. There are all kinds of examples of where are shared learning opportunities and then where are opportunities to, so that we're not, you know, not everybody is having to try to be all things to everybody, but where can we take advantage of, of specific um, opportunities to, to uh, come to the table and share learning. Other than that, I guess I should say that we officially got notice, not that, I mean, it was a non-competing award, but we officially got notice of an additional year of funding. So that's good. I know, no, it's, yeah. <laughs> Every year, probably. You have right, to well, we that. expected it. This <laughs> time we'd be angry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anything else additional? Theo, did you say Theo? Oh, yeah. oh, oh. Talk a little bit about Theo, Theo and the database systems, my oh. wonderful three-year-long conversation that I'm glad I don't have to have anymore. And um, then also a little bit of information on Family First beyond what you've discussed maybe already. Sure. And I'm going to echo this phone booth is just too hot. So. Capitol Hall is just going to have to listen to me. Um, whew, um, so yes, thank you for the reminder. We did announce that uh, all of our early Head Start home-based and healthy families programs are using CO to enter their data directly, uh, which is super exciting and a big hurdle. Our nurse family partnership uh, was deferred to a later time to synchronize activities um, that they have as public health uh, nurse home visiting program, as well as um, synchronizing with the national database uh, changeover that will be taking place starting in October for our program. So um, the key takeaway being that um, we have many, many programs now entering their data directly into FIO. Yeah. And do you all know where Erin's at on her system? I mean, she's up and running, but she's not fully integrated, right? With I don't know. Yeah, um, I do know that the doors between all the rooms have not been unlocked yet. That's the next phase, the funding that we'll we will get with some CMS funding to actually have that internal interoperability. Or, or you know. but Benjamin, do you know where they are on their development? HFO. Yeah, I think it's still, I, I just, sorry. Yeah, I, I don't. I have um, tried to defer those conversations between Tracy as our project coordinator and Erin. Um, so maybe you would have a... Well, and Sarah would know better than I, but my understanding is that she's not planning to go live statewide until January with the phase one. Okay. I didn't ask her when I saw yeah. her, so, okay. All right, okay, um, oh, Family
of Family First, which is, uh, just as a quick reminder, is the, the uh, act that allows the four-year foster care dollars to be used for prevention of foster care placement. And um, there are three main components, one being mental health services, substance abuse services, and the third being in-home services. And to date, the uh, so 50 percent of the funding must be spent on uh, well-supported in uh, services and so far the three in-home services that have been approved include Healthy Families America, Nurse Family Partnership, and Parents of Teachers. So clearly we have strong uh, networks for two of those models here in Oregon and, and I've been making sure that our partners clearly understand that. I met with Kevin George yesterday and outlined for him, uh, you know, where those services exist and how they might be able to partner with existing community-based organizations to meet the needs of the in-home services identified through the act. And um, I think it was a, I, I saw some light bulbs, I saw some opportunities, monitoring was an area apparently that they were concerned about and I shared my example of how we coordinate our monitoring activities with the model so that the models are making the assessment of fidelity and we're checking the federal boxes for funding. Um, he seemed to really like that. So <laughs> I was glad. Um, and then, um, so today, one of the reasons I really wanted to be here today is that they were starting the converse, are starting the conversation about what makes an eligible candidate for foster care. And just based on you know, the conversation that was happening before I left the room, and you know, at least one person starting to go down a pathway of court involvement. Um, and and I am happy to be here and contributing. Okay. Well, and we should probably let you go back so that you can tell them no, they can't be court involved already. <laughs> um, is there are they putting together kind of a subgroup of people to to give them some real guidance on the programs and what kind of money can be gained by by doing this? I haven't heard that. Uh, I can share with the group. Jamie Hines, who's the staff for the committee, had put together, and I, I don't know, I think from several different sources, but she has some guiding questions that are really geared toward um, uh, children and youth who uh, are either in or have experienced foster care, foster parents, uh, family of origin parents, providers, et cetera. Um, I, I guess the other, and that was the other key piece that I was uh, trying to articulate for the group before I left was um, there, and again, makes me happy that we have representation here because if left to their own devices, the group tends to gravitate toward older, and, and rightfully so, that the, the children or youth experiencing foster care or who have experienced foster care are all um, teenagers or young adults, and that is their experience, and it's not, you know, zero to three. So I was able to point out, I'm like, A, in-home services identified so far, we really kind of cap out at three for Oregon, maybe five. Um, B, uh, so, so you know, that's a problem because there should be in-home services available for older children. Um, B, they, they are all based on voluntary. And C, the, these concerns regarding risk of there not being a removal should be somewhat mitigated. I mean, again, there's a fine line, but they should be mitigated that you have someone who has regular home visits in the home, eyes on the family, family support, who are all mandatory reporters. So if there is actually a, a, an abuse, child welfare it will know it. It's not like they just go, oh, I hope this works, and then they turn away. There is there is an active you know, relationship with that family and the service. So. Um. Okay. okay, I'm gonna let you go back, but uh, two things. Please tell Kevin George that any of us sitting around this table would be happy to talk to him at any time, anywhere, any place about this. And number two, we are behind other states by a long ways. 
And I've heard that um, <laughs> we're one of two states not looking at the home visiting the way everybody else is, i.e. HFA and FP. Mm -hmm. What you remind me where the find I understand where the initial funding came from. So is it being uh, distributed through DHS, right? Yeah, it's forty dollars. And the uh, and the bottom of that bucket is pretty much bottomless. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's yeah, on the on the federal side it's an entitlement. So federal funds do not get turned off unless the state does not have the money to match. And the match is a 90-10, right? Um, when I was a child welfare, it was they talked about it typically as a 25-75, uh, with 75 being federal. Um, I, more recently, I feel like I've heard numbers that it's more of a 40-60 split, with 40% coming from the state. <laughs> yeah, but I thought, well, I, you can double check I thought family first had a little different number in it for a while. Okay. Uh, yeah, I will double check. I know I know that it's not subject to some of the changes. Uh, so it may be better off because I think it was there was some sort of a change that caused fewer children to be eligible for the draw that makes it when you look population-wide, more 40-60. So you're right, Martha, thank you. I think Family First may still be more in that 25-75 category. Yeah. Okay, keep us updated. Thank you, Benjamin. You're welcome. Thanks. Have a good day. Okay. Bye, Benjamin. Okay, so we're waiting for Miriam here. Um, um, hey. Yes. Miriam, Miriam was hoping that y'all would take the lead on the legislative conversation. Yes. She's going to be calling into that. Uh, we have a little bit of a scheduling this happened. She will definitely be here for the 310 future best beginning okay. conversation. But if y'all could take the lead on that, she'll chime in when it's yes. necessary. We can do that. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Okay, um, so let's do the UOHV. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to brand this something a little easier. <laughs> Once we can kind of catch our breath, because a lot has been happening. Um, just to get everybody up to speed, Senate Bill 526 passed, and there are two components. One is OHA um, is to design, implement, and sustain a universally offered home visiting program for all newborns in the state of Oregon. My little tagline, Oregon, the best place to be a newborn. <laughs> 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 And then um, the innovative part is that the commercial health plans are required to offer this benefit to their members to create that universality of reimbursement um, by January 2021. And so, um, and then we got the kickstart from the um, preschool development grant to kind of get things rolling a little sooner. So we um, put out for early adopters and we've got eight early adopter communities, of which is one of them. Um, the exciting part about this is that um, it includes 18 counties, so it's kind of a third of the state is is already kind of out, it's coming out age. So um, what that means financially is that the second cohort is probably going to need to be smaller because mm -hmm. we just won't have the dollars for, in this biennium. So, but we're pretty excited, I think. Um, so it's Classic Public Health, it's Lane Public Health, it's Washington County Public Health. It's Lynn Benton Lincoln Early Learning Hub, Mary Polk Early Learning Hub, Four Rivers Learning Early Learning Hub, um, and then Melier Baker out of that Early Learning Hub. They are doing well right now. And Central Oregon, so Crook the Shoot and Jefferson Early Learning Hub. So five hubs are the backbone. Three public health are the backbone. Um, we are getting ready to um, make to write rules for the statutes. Um, the, the rules will have sort of two components. One will be the programmatic components, and the other will be the components for the health plan. So we're working really closely with our partners at the Division for Business and Consumer Services, DCBS. Um, they're the insurance regulators of, of the state, from the state, um, to draft those rules. And so we are looking to use our steering committee, our Universal Office of Business 
steering committee with some other people added for so we get the right expertise as our rules advisory committee and also known as a RAC. And we will have the next three steering committee meetings will be RACs instead of our typical steering committee meeting. Um, so right now what we're doing is we're drafting rules so that there's something to react to. We're going to take those draft rules to a meeting next week of the commercial health plan so they can kind of get a look-see and um, start to get a little more comfortable. They're probably the ones that have, are most um, uh, ner not nervous, but uncertain, like, what is this really going to look like? And this is the innovative part. I mean, the, the other parts, the community alignment, we all do that. The home visiting, we all do that. The referrals, the case management, we all do that. We just have to put the mechanism in place and start marching down that process of, of strengthening the systems of care at the local level. But this insurance piece is something different. So um, so we're excited about those. The timeline for the RAC would, would be we want to have the rules drafted and have a hearing in January, and then um, after session, uh, finalize the rules, and then they would go into effect January 2021. During session, we can't do anything. So it just has to, we'll have to sit there. We can maybe get the public comment and start responding to the public comment. So you won't be delivering any services until? No, that's not true. Um, but thank you for that, because um, the when service delivery starts will be dependent upon the community. So typically there's a year-long community alignment process where all of the strengths and assets are identified and those systems of care and the referral patterns are all um, kind of put into place and who's on first and who's on second. And, and then there's the service delivery preparation. So that's nurses going to North Carolina to get trained, identifying who's going to be doing the service delivery. Um, so we have the funding right now and the me mechanisms are in place to be able to do the Medicaid population um, and Family Connects is giving us the grace. So that like, Medicaid will probably start like next July and Family Connects is giving us some grace period for the commercial plans to get on board to be universally offered. Mm -hmm. um, we're hoping that there will be enough carrots for the health plans that They'll find some other ways to support their members before the requirements. You know, they could even go sooner. They don't have to wait. They don't want to. So um, that will be part of that community conversation. We also want CCOs a part of that community conversation, um, but they aren't going to be a required provider because we have the Medicaid covered as, as a carve out from mm -hmm. the CCOs. So, um, so, so that's not part of the 2.0 plan. Right, because that was going on, yeah, but we couldn't touch that. <laughs> yeah, so um, so we'll work them in down the road. But what's exciting is we've got, you know, six years to kind of roll this out, learn lots of lessons, make lots of tweaks, get some momentum, get some data, get some, hopefully some outcomes, and build this up. Um, I will say North Carolina, just amongst us chickens, public comment people. Um, it's kind of missed that Oregon is going to do the statewide <laughs> where they are. <laughs> and so is Washington State, because they're like, we always lead the way out of Oregon. So that's kind of a fun little competition. Um, <laughs> so another yeah. add to the CRC, sorry. <laughs> Number one, when it comes to statewide home visiting programs, yeah, that's right. It, yeah. Um, we are in the process of hiring, so our, we are going to be hiring a public health nurse consultant, and that position is posted. So, mm -hmm. if you know of any nurses that are interested in this kind of a job, um, send send them to OHA jobs. Um, we'll be hiring a half-time administrative support person, a half-time research analyst to work on the data and a full-time operations and policy analyst, this will be a new skill set for public health, called a health policy integration specialist. So that person will bring the skill set of how do we bring those commercial plans in and integrate it into, um, and create that, that seamless system of care. So that's exciting. Um, so, oh, and Family Connects is hiring a person that will probably be full-time in Oregon too. So that means we're going to need that. The evaluation um, is getting going. Um, 
Family Connects is going to be subcontracting with the U of O, um, Phil Fisher's group. Sorry, that's it. <laughs> but we're going to need you too. Um, we're going to need it all to create that. That um, they're really looking at it. I mean, they're they're doing one small piece, but Duke has their own evaluation piece that is part of what we purchased when we uh, get the, when we get there. So. Um, so that's going to be getting underway. Um, our committees are underway. So we have an executive committee, which is kind of the small engine that's working on it. They've got our steering committee of about 60. And then we have our broader stakeholder group, which was is over 200. So <laughs> it keeps getting different. Yes, exactly. I think that's it. And then we'll start working on the data piece. That's the other engine. I, I visualize I'm at Union Station and I'm the quartermaster or whatever the person is that you know, says, okay, you can go and you can go and that you can go. And you can. So we've got some of these trains launched. Yeah. Kate, I was just thinking when you were talking about the integration or the interface. Remember when we did the health coverage in Rocky and Oh my gosh, Bracky. Yeah. That name is like from way, way, what, what was his last name? I can't remember. I guess you're okay. Right. But it was that interface with the insurance company. Yes. Yeah. You know, families would uh, apply for subsidized, what I call subsidized health insurance. And some got 100%, some got 75 But he had to do that interface with the company. It seems like there's like, some learning of that. Yeah. So we wouldn't have to repeat some of those. If you remember it'll come to you like maybe in the middle of the night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this was like probably right when I came on. Yeah. Well, I just but I sort of remember that. Yeah. Name. But it was well I remember because it was such an advantage just a little bit balanced. <laughs> yeah. And I kept trying to steer back to our staff even steer them in that direction. Yeah. So they could get some of that care. Yeah. But they had all that system in place for that interface it seems like might be to learn. Yeah. Great. I have a couple of questions. Um, how is the partnership with Family Connects International, like kind of the division between what are OHA staff supporting versus mm -hmm. Family Connects staff supporting? What does right. that look like? Right. So um, at this point in time, they're, they are in a large part of the driver's seat mm -hmm. because this is their model that's being implemented. Mm -hmm. And so I think as our staff come on board and work side by side, that maybe in subsequent cohorts, mm -hmm. there might be some transfer of that. But um, but we are purchasing their model, which comes along with a whole lot of TA, mm -hmm. um, and really working at the grassroots level. Mm -hmm. And I can say thank goodness for the TA and Family Connects International. They've been phenomenal. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Can we all speak up? Louder, I know they're kind yeah, of. So, Family Connects International, this is Rebecca Collette, um, has been a wonderful support to the work that we've been doing in Washington County to align and do our community alignment process. Mm -hmm. Ashley is very responsive, and we meet at least every other week. And when she's in town, we cover her time for almost a full day. Yeah, so there's a lot. Of, it's sort of different in that sense. It's not like, here's a model, go forward and mm -hmm. implement it. They're, they're like, no, we've got our model, but we will teach and work with you on how to implement it. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have a lot of learning. The, the, I mean, well, with the first thing with the the communities with what they already have and how to coordinate. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They've got their framework and kind of their process, but the process is about gathering what's in the community using the community to make the decisions, finding out what the assets are, and, and the community driving those decisions. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, I agree. Well, you, you have the, the nurse consultant, but what's the other position that you're That's the, the health plan um, integration specialist. Right. Okay. My other question was just if you can share anecdotally anything about what you learned from the LOI and application process about, uh -huh. like, yeah, I'm thinking of the lens, you know, what what does readiness look like and was um, the fact that five of the early adopter kind of backbones are early learning hubs, like, did you see any difference in readiness in those communities as a result of 
having the hub. I I think it might be too soon to yeah. know. Um, but also, when we were thinking about the LOI process, one of the things that we wanted was we wanted a variety of readiness. Right. Because we know that um, when we, we want as much learning as we can right now, because then we're going to need to apply that to subsequent cohorts. Yeah. So that's what made it really hard when we got eight, and we were only thinking we could only take five and six, and we looked at them all. We couldn't find one or two that or three that we would not accept. Um, oh, so you all chose all of the applicants. We oh, okay. all eight. Yeah. And really the limiting factor was Family Connects. Can you do this work yeah. in all these communities? And um, and they said, yes, we can. I, I do think that, um, and we did require on the in the LOI that whoever was the applicant, whether it was public health or the hub, they had to work with the other entity. Uh -huh. So um, we built in the structural piece of, uh, you know, Oregon, because of the hubs and the public health structure, we've got a lot of infrastructure there that, mm -hmm. will, that will facilitate this mm -hmm. process. So, mm -hmm. so I'm really excited that we have a mixture of who's, who's the backbone. So I keep talking about the backbone function and the service delivery function. And who does those functions? The community decides. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, the other thing that I forgot about um, with the early learning or the early adopters, um, we have some money in our budget um, to support the, the communities, and so we have carved out um, not to exceed ten thousand dollars per early adopter community to help support these activities during the community alignment. And that's a very specific number because anything over that then has to go out for bid. But we can do <laughs> they can do very quick mini grants for mm -hmm. up to ten thousand. And then when they're ready for service delivery preparation, we have another mini grant that to support the service delivery preparation. Mm -hmm. So up to ten thousand to help support sending nurses to North Carolina, get maybe billing stuff sort of down. Mm -hmm. So so the communities will get some infusion of funding. Uh, during this, these preparation pieces. Any questions or comments from the phone? Did I get all that right? You're, You're on, on the ground. ground. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it aligns with what we're trying to do. Good. Okay. <laughs> so, Kate, one question on that. Um, when you do start to do the service delivery, um, will the Screenings be done more by the um, Universal Connects um, people, or will it be a joint process with the other programs? That's going to be decided by the community. Got it. Yeah, it will look very different in different places. Okay, um, so um, I look forward to kind of seeing different models of how that will look. Okay, super. I know. They all do their own, but right. And you know, HSA HSA has been very involved with the implementation in Durham and and right. whatever or Guilford County. And so um, they are prepared. Like if um, if Oregon or some community within Oregon needed a waiver not to do that initial screening, they would be able to do that. And it, it could free up funding that would go only to the intensive, you know, and, and increase the capacity of intensive services. So I, and that's just an option, and so I think it will depend on the communities as to how they want to work that out. So, and Aaron's been involved in all of this, right? Yeah. Yeah, I had a yeah. small conversation about that. I'm not sure how many screeners we have anymore. Right. Yeah. One other um, kind of vision piece that I have, <laughs> and so help me think through, and I mean, I think where we're going to go, but we might need some funding, um, is we know we have a nursing shortage. And we know that this model does not require a bachelor's trained nurse. It could be a two-year degree, two-year RN. So my vision to actually increase the um, community connectedness, especially for our communities of color, is as we do community alignment or even sooner, seeing if, if there are people from the community that are interested in becoming a nurse and somehow scholarshiping them to get their two-year RN and be able to go back to a job. 
So that's something that I'm I'm trying to pitch around and I'm hoping yeah, that I maybe can, off the top of my head, Kate, I can think of three people I know <laughs> who would do that. I mean, yeah, but they don't have the funds to go back to school. Right, right. So I, you know, this is something where foundations, you know, would be really interesting in terms of workforce development. Um, Hospitals. The state did a program with that. We did it. And we had hospitals um, in terms of extended care. We did it for Latino mothers. Yeah. Uh huh. But they, but the hospitals supported them, and some of the supported them while they got their AA because they thought that they're out there too. Yeah. Right. So I think that uh, as we get the hospitals and the health plans mm -hmm. on board, but that could be interesting because you all are starting with the hospital. The first. I know same hospital did. Yeah. So we might need to talk with um, Mary Polk. We'll approach the hospital. Okay. I think but the challenge would be integrating the staff into this is where you have media bargaining agreements and right. rules around recruitment and things like that. But I love the idea of there's got to be a way. <laughs> right. <laughs>
identified. Two, a need identified, but it was taken care of in that home visit. Three, a need for a referral. And four, an emergency like call 911 right now. And so um, a lot a lot of work can just be done with families in that home visit in terms of education. Mm -hmm. um, and then referrals to some other community uh, resources. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right, it's gonna it's gonna shine a light on the gap. Yeah. Which is all right. Yeah. I'm gonna move us along because Miriam should be here in a couple of minutes and we still have a legislative update. I may have to alleviate the uh, round table sharing unless somebody has something really burning they, they want to share. Okay. All right. So the legislative update, um, I'm just going to rock it through the bills that I've got on my list. And if there's anything, Kate, out of Oregon Health Authority that's not on my list, please fill in. All right. <laughs> And if anybody else has anything that we've left out, fill in. So uh, HB 2024 creates Baby Promise Program, uh, which are contracted slots for infant toddler child care. That passed. HB 2346 establishes a task force on child care. That passed. They're in the uh, process of identifying the members on that. And they... Uh, the advocates who help pass that legislation are trying to take a focus on infants and toddlers um, with the task force as well. HB 2348, improved child care co-pays. Um, that was to get improved child care co-pays. We could not get a bill introduced. Um, it was opposed by EHS. Um, it was opposed and we're going to try and get the task force to consider that. Uh, early HB 2897, Early Childhood, uh, I'll get this all out, Early Childhood Equity Fund uh, was wrapped into and included in the Student Success Act, and I'll, I hope I've got a dollar figure for you in a minute. HB 3427, which was the Student Success Act itself, not the funding, includes uh, equity fund, pre-K, a little bit of home visiting, relief nurseries, EIECSC, that passed. HB 5015, the Oregon Department of Education grant made budget, that's their continuing budget, that passed with continuing service levels, which basically means there was a little bit of a bump in some uh, programs. HB 5026, the Department of Human Services budget included child care subsidy, passed uh, with no, <clears throat> no new funding, but at continuing service levels. HB, let me see, where'd I go? I gotta, I'm going too fast here. HB 5525, the Oregon Health Authority budget, including public health dollars to implement universally offered home visiting, passed. Um, and Kate, you got $4 million for the first round, right? No, it's I think it's two something, and then we get federal dollars for drug and federal dollars. So I think the whole thing is, we're going back and forth. I got those numbers wrong the other day. I know, I'm like, no, we got to we got to anger this. So, um, we have enough to do this biennium. <laughs> <laughs> that's enough to do it. <laughs> that, that's fair. Thank that's you. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> we'll come up with numbers later on. HB 5047 um, was the allocation of funds for the Student Success Act. Uh, Relief Nurseries got a 25% increase. Uh, support of all day and teacher pay um, will increase slots. Early Learning Equity Fund, which will provide culturally specific preschool programs for thousands of, all I've got is thousands of three and four year olds. I'm still trying to get numbers out of the ELD. I don't think they figured it all out. On how much money is going? Um, how many slots? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, 
Hi, Martha. This is Miriam. Um, I've been listening in. I would just say um, the, uh, the estimate right now is about um, around 5,000 slots of the equity fund um, at 20 million a biennium. Um, it is uh, uh, for birth to five investments. And I think some of the work now is really, we anticipate there will be a variety of different models funded. So, you know, at different um, cost per child or per family. So those are right. sort of the rough estimates that we have right now. Okay, that's good to know because I we've been having trouble uh, figuring out on the advocate side what who were how many we're serving. Thank you. Um, the early intervention early childhood special education fund, as I understand, fully funded for all children diagnosed. Is that also correct, Miriam? <coughs> yes, uh, uh, for uh, children, infants, toddlers, and preschoolers to receive the recommended service levels. Okay, and, and Miriam, we have someone here from EIECSC with us today, too. Oh, great, um, so they can answer that better than me, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but it is really just to fund the recommended mm -hmm. service level, so to get the state to adequate levels of service. Okay. Uh, Latino Student Success Plan um, joins other culturally specific student success plans for all ages, including early childhood, Healthy Families Oregon, uh, is to receive a $2 million bump, so that's a $4 million overall total. Uh, Reach Out and Read, we didn't think we were going to see anything for them, but they got $300,000 increase. SB 526 implements universally offered home visiting, and that passed. That was outside of the funding piece that was in Oregon Health Authority budget. SB 543 allows local communities for children's service districts to raise revenue. That failed. Uh, HB 2025 revises the state's preschool statute. That passed. Uh, paid family leave, HB 2005, and medical leave passed. HB 2027 expands what Office of Child Care can consider in a background check, that passed. HB 2262 modifies membership of the Early Learning Council, that passed. HB 3394 modifies the requirements of child care resource and referral providers, that passed. SB 116 sets special election for Student Success Act, that passed but we aren't going to have a special election on that. So that bill basically is um, dead, gone. Um, SB 490 prohibits individuals with sub substantiated child abuse from providing child care, that passed. SB 813 directs the Office of Child Care to follow up on complaints about providers, that passed. Um, do you wanna know about any more? Or are those in the lot? <laughs> we we had a big session. Um, like there was uh, the renewal and increase of the state EITC passed. Um, did you say paid family leave? Did you say paid family leave? I did say paid family leave, right. The other one I would add, included in the Student Success Act is a substantial increase in funding for early Head Start. Yeah. So much greater than oh, yeah. has to be. Yeah. I think. I probably have that in here and just it's just over the line. Yeah. Okay, For so this I, group and just and that's center based and home based early head start, both either. Yes. So there's early head start, there's head start money, or I mean there's pre K money, and then there's uh the little bit of HFO money. Okay. And why do you think there's an electricity bill in there? Which one? Is it in the student that is that? Yeah, under the statewide initiative yeah. bucket is funding for the Yeah. Because that's just important for these so many of our children. Yeah. Um, the tobacco tax referral pass. Mm -hmm. uh, funds used to reduce use smoking, including e cigarettes, and used for health care. Although they may ban e cigarettes, so I don't know. Um, what else? I'm looking at dead, dead, dead. We don't need to hear about that. Um, HJM3 urges Congress to fully fund the individual 
Individuals with Disability Education Act that passed. Uh, HJR 15 encourages state agencies to follow child and early parenting principles. So that goes along with some of the others that we were talking about. Uh, SB 13 updates language on special education eligibility for developmentally delayed to comply with federal laws that passed. And then SB 1008, which I had to stay neutral on because of my VA's youth sentencing reform passed. And that was Jackie Winters' bill. Did I miss anything? I don't know. I, don't know. I think Go. that maybe you got it. That was pretty comprehensive and um, HB 2025, which was our preschool alignment bill, um, that uh, uh, um, included a provision for Head Start grantees to be able to convert um, existing slots to infant and toddler slots in their community. I do not have that. Identify one. that. Okay. I added it to my list. Yes. <laughs> I got that. Okay. All right. So, anybody want to add anything? I'm just going to say that it was um, it was a raucous. Yeah. <laughs> few months. Um, every time we have a session, I keep saying, boy, this is the worst one I've been through. Um, yeah. I mean, we received a lot of money, but it was this one, um, I'm just going to say before we, mm -hmm. we turn it over to you, that it was um, it was a difficult session. We normally go with joint ways and means, and we have those committees that we deal with. This time we have to deal not only with joint ways and means, but we have to deal with the Student Success Act committee members. They sometimes were the same members as the ways and means, sometimes they were not. Um, we were chasing, as you can tell with this list, an awful lot of bills. Um, there was an awful lot on child care that was presented. Um, there were some good things that came out of child care and there were some things that didn't happen in child care. What I've not listed on here, which probably um, this committee would be interested in some of those outcomes though, uh, was what happened on the DHS side um, through those bills. And since those were not ones that we necessarily were tracking as advocates, I don't have, um, but that was an interesting um few hearings as well. And I'm tired and I don't want a short session, but we're getting ready for that already. <laughs> yeah. Wednesdays are over. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then our process inter internal to state government until it starts. Yeah. Right after oh. short session. Yeah. So yeah. I just really can't believe that. Yeah. Yeah. From afar, and you're like, oh, every two years, you get a year in between. No, oh. no. <laughs> yeah, I used to have a boss that said, okay, session's over with. Now, what are you going to do for the next few months? And it's like, a start all over. <laughs> <laughs> and never stop. So, you would think, God, we're not on Michigan where they go all the time. And there are a few states that their legislature is on all the time. Yeah. The, the West has a kind of different philosophy <laughs> about things. We try to stop. <laughs> so anyway. All right. So that's that. Um, and if you want anything, if I, and I know I just shot down it because we didn't have a lot of time. Um, if there's any one of these you want more information on, just shoot me an email and I'll get you that information. Okay. So now we're going to go to the last item on our agenda, which is um, the future of best beginning. And first, Miriam, um, we're going to go around and introduce ourselves because I don't know if you know everyone sitting at the table. And we have, how many of you are still on the phone? Two or three? Marguerite, are you there? Okay, so Marguerite was on and she's not. Uh, Christy, you're still there? Yeah, hi, this is Christy Cox from Ford Family Foundation. Hey. Hi, Christy. I'm driving to Roseburg tonight. Meet me later. Hi. Coffee? <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, well, and the other person on the phone uh, is from down that area, too. You could have coffee with both. Okay. Athena, do you want to introduce yourself? Maybe not. She's still on. She's still on. Yeah. You're on mute. 
Yeah. Oh, sorry, there we go. Uh, this is Athena Wickstrom. I'm the administrative assistant for the South Central Early Learning Hub, and I'm listening in for Jillian Wiesenberg today. Great. Hi, Athena. Thanks. Okay. Let's start to Miriam Strike. Me. Hi, Ben Green from the University. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lindsay Manfred, Campo County Health and Human Services Deputy Director of Public Health. Okay, we'll cost maternal child health that way. <laughs> Rebecca Collette with Washington County. Sherry Alderman, the head in the mental health participation. Meredith Lines, OBEIECSC, Parent Strategy Specialist. Martha Brooks. Helena. Children's Institute. Hi. Hi. Miriam, or Lizard Division. <laughs> okay. I'm going to move this closer to you. So, um, for all of you, um, just kind of just set the stage some. Um, as you know, we've discussed over several months that the Early Learning Council uh, would be making some changes. And, um, we didn't know what those were, and so it was like, hang on, wait, um, because we have responsibilities. <laughs> yeah. And um, so everybody's stuck with it, um, but we've stuck with it for, as Elena and I have explained to Miriam and Sue, for a lot of different reasons that we have responsibilities to healthy families, Oregon has the advisory. We have responsibilities to McV as um, the steering committee that uh, uh, operates under the McV grants. And then, of course, we have that passion for the prenatal to age three and the expertise sitting around the table. Um, the, and at this point, I think, Miriam, I'll just let you take over. Uh, we know that the uh, Early Learning Council is changing. You've got two of us here that are former members, and it um, be kind of nice to know where that sits as well, who's maybe who's on, who's who's still left to fill or whatever, um, nine positions total. And then uh, where, um, where you see us, because I've gotten phone calls and emails going, so what's going on, why, why are, have we canceled meetings, and um, what's the responsibility and uh, quite frankly I think the conversation we have we feel that there's still a, a great need for your prenatal page three group so um, okay. I'll let Thanks. others speak okay. because I've spoken to you about how I yep. So, hi, I'm glad to be here. I know we have about 25 minutes, so I'm going to talk fast, slow me down, um, and there's a lot I want to cover in terms of an update, so I'm just going to kind of reference some notes here, but I thought what I'd do, as Martha suggested, is just talk about where the council is, raise up Oregon implementation, some of the structural changes, how we're seeing the work going forward. Um, I want to... Um, also just really engage in a discussion with you kind of given that information um you know what uh where you think you know kind of what feedback you would have that we could sort of bring to the council about how we um sort of implement this work and then i think in particular home visiting with so much that's going on in terms of expansion and and kate's update about the the program for newborn families with newborns so um so let me just dive in. First, I just want to um, express um, our appreciation, I think, on behalf of the council um, and my colleagues at the Early Learning Division for all the work that you've done um, um, individually and collectively around, um, you know, uh, really thinking deeply about our prenatal to age three system. Um, I was thinking about this conversation and reflecting on how much we leverage that in the development of Raise Up Oregon, the infant and toddler assessment, um, all of the thinking and coordination, I mean, to come and have um, already, um, you know, the thinking I, I'm, for myself and kind of coming into Oregon, we did a lot, I was doing a lot of work in D.C. before coming around our, uh, the district sort of home visiting council and trying to figure out how to get different home visitation programs and models to have some kind of structure to talk about cross-cutting issues and it's sort of like coming here and already seeing so much that's been able to be coordinated. Um, 
through this committee was is really just amazing. So um, again, thank you uh, deeply. Um, the and we'll talk about this in a little bit through the discussion, but there's going to be plenty for all of you to do, I think, and be able to continue this work. So um, I hope you'll all stay um, very engaged, and that's really what I want to update you on and sort of talk about. Um, so re as a reminder, Raise Up Oregon has the baby icon <laughs> around um, all of its uh, the strategies. Um, David, you know, is working at the ELD as our prenatal to three systems fellow under the partnership has already done a nice little um, analysis just of the baby icon strategies and legislation across that like whole range of things that um, those bills and investments, not just those that are administered by ELD, but what's in OHA, what's in DHS. So um, that was really exciting to see. Um, we've done that. I know for the ELD, um, so not just cutting kind of sort of prenatal to three, but kind of thinking about um, prenatal to five, um, what is happening at the ELD, and we've done the council um, with a group of, of staff from the five different agencies that are that have their early childhood priorities kind of represented in Raise Up Oregon have done that. So there's been, um, and Kate's here, and I uh, invite you to speak about this too, um, there's been, you know, this cross-sector group, which has a really long name, we need a better name, but Agency Implementation Coordinating Committee, um, yes, <laughs> right, has been meeting um, over the summer. And I should take a step back and say the council, as Martha talked about, is in transition because of the legislation um, that she referenced um, where it's uh, – being, you know, it's going down to nine members, which is sort of was original size, the creation in 2012. A lot of why the, um, the membership increased was because of uh, uh, federal legislation around um, the Head Start, Head Start, in the Head Start Act around state advisory councils. So there will be um, a committee that meets the requirements and that's talked about in that legislation of the Head Start um, bill. And the way I think about the intent of the Head Start Act is really to bring kind of a, um, a court, having an advisory uh, committee at the state level that can bring together um, all and better coordinate all of the early care and education programs that we know are also among different state agencies, right? So I think we have some programs in ELD, we have some programs at ODE, we have some programs at DHS, just when we think about sort of childcare. Um, and preschool investments um, and home visiting. So that's a bit of um, the intent around that. But anyway, so we this this group has been busy as the governor's office is um, doing its work to um, constitute sort of a new council. Um, this group has been really, I think, met a couple of times um, and done some incredible work around, um, again, mapping um, you know, what, you know, what was in Raise Up Oregon, including the infant and toddler strategies with what happened in session um, and engaging um, in conversations around uh, what are the priorities, right? So what are the different all across all five state agencies? What do we anticipate in the next 18 months? It's going to be the key work, right, to lift up. So that's really important to know. And I wanted you all to know that because, um, we uh, were, you know, really are really serious about raise, implementing Raise Up Oregon, and so it's happening. You know, I think sometimes we you do a lot of work to put a great vision together, um, and I think it's just been a phenomenal experience to say that um, that plan really did help in session. I think carried over into session, and um, now we. Um, as Martha noted, had a lot of wins um, related to, to those strategies. Um, and so now we are really um, involved in implementation. I think this committee, as the work of this agency implementation committee, as they identify um, and really help support lifting up what are those priorities for the next 18 months is going to be really critical information um, to engage in what does the right committee structure look like for the council moving forward. Um, I think um, for me, I think it's a really great opportunity and I know what some of the conversations have been are related to, you know, what's the, um, where do you need some flexibility um, with 
membership and composition um, and where do the state agencies really need that flexibility to be able to sort of drive their work. An observation I had sort of coming into the council was in addition to uh, coming into Oregon and into this role and, and doing work with the council, I think prior to Raise Up Oregon is there, have been, there is a lot of work that was happening in standing committees. There was also a lot of work happening in state government through work groups um, that were not always as connected to the council. And um, that always, you know, and really good work that I think would have been, you know, um, beneficial for the council to know about and sort of be mutually reinforced, right? So um, I think that we have an opportunity with a, um, finding a balance of what are some standing committees, but where agencies really need flexibility. I know I, in my two years here, I could identify a couple where, um, and I think we've started to do that as a council, you know, to um, more and more, and some of this happened before of chartering an ad hoc or really thinking about, you know, where do we need to be more nimble and more flexible um, in um, and responding to opportunities or, um, or being able to do something within six months or a year. So I think that hopefully that's sort of like a long-winded way of saying, um, you know, as I think about the council structure going forward, um, as far as committees go, and we could talk a little bit more about this, that we'll have some balance of some standing committees and some um, a more, uh, you know, probably see more ad hocs. And I think that the work that this agency implementation team is doing right now um, in in really mapping um, what happened in session and priorities and what agencies will be implementing relative to their early childhood priorities is really going to help inform that. So any questions or comments? Kate, you've been um, experiencing this too, so anything you want to add, please feel free to jump in, but part of these conversations. Um, I will say this um, agency implementing coordinating committee. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's pretty exciting because it's um, the conversation, it's just like, oh, we're doing that. Oh, we're doing that. And it really is, is showing its value in terms of connecting the dots. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's the right pitch of level within the agencies, if you will. So it's not the directors who you know, do director leadership pieces, but it's those who kind of know what's going on, may not be the actual SMEs or those really doing the work, but know enough to be able to look across and connect those dots mm -hmm. and bring in that expertise to the committee um, for further. Right, exactly. And some of the work that's happening too is, I think, and this is really important to think about, um, the other, um, what are, is mapping where existing committees or tables that already exist that, you know, to, that can support kind of implementation of that strategy. So where we go and I think where we land in a mix of sort of what are standing committees and what are, um, uh, you know, other committees that are needed to move priorities will also be informed again by, you know, what's already happening. So I think you heard from Kate earlier, there's already a, a group that has been meeting around the universally offered home visiting program, quite a large, <laughs> two very large tables for that. So I think that's the kind of information that we're sort of gathering and mapping right now um, that I think is going to be use, very useful and, and that really identifying um, where our gaps um in our current structure. But again, because the council um, is um, in this transition phase of um, appointing um, new members, um, you know, there are no decisions made at this time. I'm really kind of just sharing with you what some of the, I think, the conversations have been and, and a lot of work that and thought that's gone into um, sort of thinking about what is an appropriate structure for the council um, including committees to support like getting this work done around implementation. Um, jumping back for a minute to the council, um, I do want to make sure that um, folks are aware that the, for the nine members, um, there is a real commitment, I think, to have representation from all of the different sectors that are represented in the plan amongst those nine members. The legislation also says a representative from each congressional district. Um, we're very excited that the legislation also now says there will be a representative from a tribal nation um, in law. There will also be a workforce representative um, on the council. And we're um, also um, hoping to bring and ensure that there's 
represent, uh, representative from philanthropy um, and also from the business sector. So five sectors, five congressional districts, a tribal representative, a workforce representative, a business representative, and a philanthropic representative for nine seats. So uh, you can imagine <laughs> that that's, um, no, we need some multiple hat people. Um, as well, we're really committed to diversity, racial diversity, geographic diversity, and keeping that perspective in the council. So. Um, Lots of grit, I can say, um, in the governor's office in terms of this work. So um, the goal is by, uh, you know, the council, um, there are dates held for council retreat for new council members um, in late October. So that was the goal to have um, announcements. Um, so I'm, I can't share anything about um, you know who, but I can say, you know, we're, I think we're we're getting close and the. Um, Governor's office um, has been doing a lot of work to um, to seat a new council um, in time for our our allotted retreat dates. Um, but again, um, you know, this is going to be the council, the new council in late October. The retreat is really going to be the first opportunity to have um, a more in-depth conversation, kind of around the structure and the council committees. Um, so. I want to, um, I can talk a little bit about, um, I think Martha teed it up well with the legislative update. I can talk a little bit about what's happening at ELD around implementation right now of some things, or we, um, maybe it might be better to just sort of um, talk first and then if there's time at the end, I can sort of do that update, but just sort of transition into what um, I you know, want to give you all opportunity to say, what, what do you think is really needed um, around, um, I think kind of based on some of this really around really interested in home visiting in particular, but like more broadly, any input that you've had from your experiences or things you would want me to kind of carry forward as we think about um, what's important um, to stay um, coordinated around and implementing in particular the infant and toddler strategies um, um, in Raise Up Oregon, what do you see as the opportunities? What do you think are the priorities? What are some of the biggest challenges around coordination for home visiting? So um, um, I'm kind of eager to hear that um, and some of your feedback. Uh, I will say too that the before um, I kind of stop talking, um, the roles around the I, you know the um, McV and HFO advisory committees are also something I think we we need to pay attention to. And so as you think about um, what's the right kind of structure in particular for coordinating home visiting and kind of continue to go going going forward with that, um, you know, we can have um, if things are more programmatic in nature, they can be advisory to that specific agency, for example, um, or and so for HFO, that could be, you know, advisory to ELD or, you know, I think we could we could combine those. We could think about different, a lot of different structures sort of advisory. I would say that um, where we want to keep the kind of elevation at the council as we think about this is really around kind of more systems issues. So as we were thinking about um, maybe what would be needed for the council around home visiting, would that be, what are some of the needs there? Is that a, a focus around um, retention um, and development of, you know, of home visiting staff um, and directors of programs? Is it really thinking about compensation? Is it thinking about connecting home visitors to, the, to broader systems? I mean, I think those would be more in just the direction of where we're trying to elevate sort of council committee work. Um, and I think we have lots of different ways that, um, you know, pro, it, a, a conversation or group of individuals that are really advisory to the agency more around programmatic issues could stay different from the council. So that's just something that I want to um, throw out there and get your thoughts on as you sort of in particular give me some feedback around home visiting and what the right structure is. But I really... Um, I, I guess my point I wanted to say, and to your questions, Martha, about prenatal to three, I really don't think that um, this isn't decided yet, but I think that there could be and will be 
um, given the focus of in, on, on um, prenatal to three strategies in Raise Up Oregon, the potential for there be more than one committee or multiple committees um, where this work is moving. I just think we, a lot of that is dependent upon, um, you know, what what I think surfaces from a lot of this work that the agency implementation coordinating committee is doing right now around mapping the priorities and existing um, work groups at the state level and determining which ones should be coordinated, you know, con connected to the council and which ones, um, and where do we need actually a new kind of structure, right, to be able to drive the cross-sector work. So any qu hopefully that's clear. Any questions about that? So I'm going to open it up to, um, others here in the room because you and I have conversations. Mm -hmm. so, Lana, um, we do have two things and I'm going to hold those until the end the last few minutes. Few minutes okay. um, and that's one the HFO conversation we had that Marguerite wanted us not to forget about and then um, the CRC. Okay. Can I ask for clarification? Yeah. You said different from the council. Meaning that it could be there could be committees out there that didn't necessarily report to the council, but that did work that could um, be community, for example, be a community committee that could uh, bring information to the council. What would you say? Different from, I'm just trying to... Yeah, no, great question. Um, I think that um, ad, sort of advisory to the agency around implementation, a program is program issues that are not necessarily um, policy issues or cross-sector kind of system issues. So, for example, um, you know, as we've been thinking about... Uh, you know, if we we're thinking about the equity fund implementation, we may have a need to bring, um, you know, stakeholders who have been from culturally specific organizations that have been doing this work to advise on a set of kind of questions or information that doesn't always need to, that doesn't need to flow through the council. Or um, I think um, the HFO advisory, um, uh, the uh, group could be one that you could say potentially that is a group that Aaron Dean needs to you know convene and really talk more about programmatic issues and not necessarily about systems you know there's no systems issues there so I think those are some of the conversations we're also trying to determine and I think that happens um, pretty frequently because sometimes you need to have real conversations with people that are you know implementing the program and giving feedback on on um, and support to, um, you know, at the state level, the program managers. So, program, right, exactly, right, exactly. But those would be not policy issues or, you know, uh, system sort of cross sector system issues. So that we could have one, for example, an OPK, where we're convening regularly with Head Start, you know, to and so. Christy, you're on the phone. Do you have anything? Well, I, thanks, Miriam, for the overview. I have to admit, I got a little bit overwhelmed in terms of the type of feedback that you might be looking for. Yeah. Um, but there's a couple things that came to mind. Let me know if I'm off base or, or reframe the question for me. That would be helpful. But one is, um, I think there's always the um, need to be take great care with how it, any committees are formed. And I just think that, you know, it's not always easy to know when one is forming or how to get involved in it. Um, yeah. So just as you're thinking about that process, um, trying to build in maybe some standardized approaches so that you aren't always getting the same people around the table, yet you're getting who you need, or the types yeah. of voices that you're interested in hearing. So I don't know if there's some way to kind of codify the process for even when you're having ad hoc committees that might not last very long that there be a way where you're really getting a diverse uh, group of voices. Um, yeah, that's, that's a great point. I think, yeah, it, I think when you hear about committees that get formed after the fact, you think, well, how did, how did they know? How did it happen? Um, the other mm -hmm. comment that I think is just around um, for long-standing committees, even like this one of the best beginnings, I think having some really clearly straight stated purposes 
um, and deliverables even, if that's the right word, um, is really helpful also. It just gives um, kind of lights the fire on what it is that that particular ad hoc or long-term committee is really dedicated towards or trying to make happen. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that's probably it for right now. Christy, do you have, um, and you, it's fine to, um, you know, if you want to think about this and, you know, shoot me an email or, you know, meet me in Roseburg later, but um, <laughs> do you uh, love your thoughts on um, uh, strategies or things that you think have worked particularly well, even whether that's things that we've done in the past with, through the council in terms of um, getting information out or other other things that you've seen other state agencies do because I think that that's uh, that's a really important point um, in terms of how we get the word out and and I think on the charges piece I think that's you know and clearly defined goals and that's absolutely spot on that's why we're um, and that there's been so much work this summer around engagement to both think about where where um, where do we truly need committees? What would the focus be? I think some of the ad hocs could really help ensure that, you know, from the start there's specific charges and then where we know we really recognize we need standing committees, we've really identified, you know, the, the, the true purposes for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll think a little bit about your question about outreach. I mean, I, we talked just a tiny bit about this earlier on a whole completely different topic, but I don't think there's any like silver bullet approach. I just think um, yeah. trying to get something that's universally used by whenever the committee gets formed so that it's not mm -hmm. just a, like, oh my gosh, we need something next month. Let's grab who we can get. Mm -hmm. But instead that there's real mindfulness around it every yeah. time. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned, um, and I think really off base, so please correct me if I'm mm -hmm. wrong. But so one of the needs, I'm more operational in Washington mm -hmm. County, but one of the needs that you can really see in the Tri-County area and as, as we have grappled with other what other communities are doing mm -hmm. around how we talk about um, internal and family coordinated entry, so mm -hmm. a coordinated, some sort of coordinated entry system. Uh, it could be around home visiting, it could be mm -hmm. around other
and I appreciate your vision about how it would be a council that represents the cross sector of the unified early learning system to address the needs of that system. Um, but ha so when it, you're thinking about that work, the state systems efforts, but then you're also talking about uh, the committee work or the ad hoc work um, about points in the it, like the initiatives or, or the strategies. Um, how is how is it different? Like, what would implementate a cross sector implementation look like uh, on a committee versus in the early learning council? Mm -hmm. So just so that maybe we can have a better idea of which level to raise up uh, certain things. Mm -hmm. Well, sure, I, I'll start by saying it's, um can't take credit for the vision, <laughs> the role of the council being that, that's definitely legislation, and I think it's really been renewed. Yes, thanks. Um, very, and very renewed, I think, focus because of Race Up Oregon and all the work that the council did um, and community partners and hubs did to put that plan together. Um, so, yeah, the um, yeah, I think the legislation makes clear that and it speaks to the values in Oregon that you know to make um, that the council is sort of a focal point or a coordinated and coordinating entity for that full mm -hmm. like comprehensive system. And so right now that's really being defined by Raise Up Oregon. I think in the five early child the early childhood priorities of the five state agencies. So we want representation um, from all of those sectors on the council. Um, and I think that means, um, you know, we've had in the previous council more early care and education sector representation and expertise. Um, so going down to nine from 16 and trying to bring in other expertise, I think it's sort of what is um, happening right now with some of the changes. But um, in, so that's some one piece. Um, they, the um, council will continue to have the um, agency directors. Um, myself included as ex officio non-voting members. That that's another sort of change in the legislation. That also is more consistent with other um, policy, you know, state policy boards. For example, anybody, my position um, doesn't vote. You know, so Coquille won't vote um, at the state board of ed. So there's just some kind of alignment um, pieces happening. Um, that the committees. I believe whether they're ad hoc or standing committees and kind of what that looks like um, will be the opportunities to um, get sort of deeper into those implementation issues. Um, the council also won't be meeting as frequently to allow time for more of that work. I think some, you know, council members sitting as, you know, the appointed members will be engaged in the committees as well. Um, so, uh, and I think what you'll start, what will happen really at um, full council meetings is you'll see more of that, more of the reporting up from the various committees feeding and sort of driving the agendas of the full council meetings. That's happened in the past, but um, I say that um, one way to think about this, and I keep it straight in my own mind, is that the council is really making a shift from primarily working with one state agency, the ELD to working with five, if we're gonna achieve that vision of truly of the early learning council that, that is um, talked about in legislation. So there has to be creating, I think, um, both representation on the, on the full council and through the committees of those cross-sector committees. I think one way to think about this is how would the um, equity implementation committee, for example, that's been a standing committee, have um, representation of um, other sort of cross sector agents, uh, you know, at more expertise and really being a place and a committee that can um, provide that, I think, kind of sort of um, direction around systems and sort of policy issues that relate to equity that impact early childhood broadly beyond the programs that ELD administers. I think that yeah, the balancing act, though, is that it's still the policy board for the early learning division. So it still retains rulemaking and and for the programs that ELD administers. Um, I think another exciting area that we'll be exploring, and I know this has been talked about a lot in the past, is how, though, therefore, 
how could the council though have more engagement with the other policy boards when there is rulemaking that is relevant to their early childhood priorities, right? So I think that's another area we it's ready to find. I think what you just said is really important, and I would encourage what you said around um, having people on the council engaged into the committee work, whether, mm -hmm. that's, whether it's ad hoc or standing committees. I think that's critical uh, because without that, the work of the committee is just sort of gets lost. And I feel like that's happened some. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I think that's critical, and I would encourage you to think about it more of as actual having it be a requirement that the people on the council are engaged in a committee or multiple committees so that there is that direct connection and that that is yep. always happening. Because I think it's too easy if it's just something that, yes, we want this to happen, for it to not happen for yep. so many reasons that no one intends to ever yep. happen. But uh, if you make it that the requirement, it, it really kind of holds the fault yep. that. Great, that thank you. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I also think that one of the, given the structure, it sounds like the committee work is even more important. Mm -hmm. Because this is where you're going to share the ideas and even in this committee, there were several charges that we were given, and as we worked through those, we realized, Ooh, this is not the way I'm thinking about this sheet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so forever, but we did figure out <laughs> those things that would have been not good had we not taken the time to do that. Mm -hmm. So to have the diversity of thought allowed us to find those problems that we were Council still came up with two things. 
that have come to us from the group mm -hmm. that, you know, we, we'd like to push somewhere. One of those is um, came out of Aaron's report and a lot because we are that. Uh, that works with the dot, what I call dotting the I's and crossing the T's, and then we still have to do that that um, referral. But she's got a couple of programs that are, you know, not going to re-up their contracts. And why is that? And one of them is Eastern Oregon, and the conversation here was, is, is the early learning division open to splitting out some of that, the early thought process was they all have to be one contract under a hub, and yet we've got an area that's not functioning. And we can have the conversation that they're not functioning because they don't go on or because they're geographically separated and can't even drive from Wallow to directly on a road, they have to go through one or another county in order to get there. And so, you know, it, can we push? Is it not worth keeping a group together that understand to get every time out? what's going on to make recommendations as we see them that come up today. Um, Sherry Alderman gave on the um, uh, <laughs> that's mm -hmm. um, on um, the um, rights of children and what the UN has done about it and that the U.S. is the only ones that have not ratified um, the right the on the right of children. And can we can we do that as Sherry said as as a state? And yeah we can, but what's the mechanism? And would we be able to recommend, because we're here having this this large prenatal age three conversation, which this would go up to, you know, a higher level of age. How do those ideas come to you if we're not doing the brainstorming down here on a regular basis? And can we push that up to the Early Learning Council so that they can send it to uh, the governor's um, advisor? So that's my concern about let's just do ad hoc. Um, we, we lose expertise. We have to get everybody up to speed again. You're going to get a lot of the same people. And how do you how do you get those those brilliant ideas that are going to come? Yeah. I mean, I don't. I, I thank you for those comments. I don't think that it's only ad hoc. There's a couple of standing committees that are required, like the early care and education committee. So I think you know what, as I said, right now what we're what the work that's happening right now is really. Um, mapping what currently exists, what's in legislation, um, and uh, that is required, um, and, you know, and what currently exists in terms of being responsive to the other agencies who, you know, have their own um, advisory committees, different policy boards, and um, because they have early childhood priorities in their plans that we're trying to kind of unify all of these. So I, I can definitely take those issues that you said forward. It's not my decision to make a loan. Um, uh, I probably imagine that there will be a hybrid of both. And I think as we look across the different, you know, what's, what are, what's, um, what are the opportunities I think created through this legislative session to implement Remember, these infant and toddler strategies will, will really have good information to say um, where what, what we need, because I think it is true, as has as also been said here before, how to have a very specific and focused charge, um, be able to have that membership, and I think there will be really um, a lot of opportunities for everybody here, whether that's on one standing committee that looks like best beginnings with a you know, maybe slightly different charge, or there are a couple of committees, one that's needed, you know, um, 
uh, specific to implementation of a specific strategy or something that a, that one of the agencies is doing. You know, I want to make sure that you all know about these opportunities. I know we're running out of time, so I um, again just want to say. Um, express my appreciation for all the work that you've done and I know there will be opportunities to be engaged and definitely know that we're committed to getting you um, the answers to what the structure looks like as soon as the council gets going and and kind of some of these decisions are made so hopefully um, that's helpful in the meantime if you have other thoughts please don't hesitate to email me as you kind of think about this especially I think around the home visiting pieces I know Kate and I and our teams can do some more thinking too so would love your feedback about that one thing and I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn here or not but um, I think sometimes we get stuck thinking that when we develop a structure that's going to be it and, and there's no possibility. yeah and so I think just thinking about, okay, what could we start with mm -hmm. and see how it goes? Mm -hmm. And then um, maybe put out like a year or whatever, an opportunity to revisit, see what's working well and what's not, and, um, and have some dynamic or some flexibility in that. Absolutely. Because, um, I mean, the, the whole focus of the council, it's not, about, not the whole focus, but it's really going to be a, a transformational shift. Um, and so that's going to you know, send out different kinds of ripple effects mm -hmm. too. And so just being um, having that flexibility in mind, I think might be helpful. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I you know I think the. Um, the this structure has been you know was developed around a different in a different time in our state around the system and with a different strategic plan right and really getting an early learning division up and running and some of those pieces so i think this is that natural kind of a natural point with a new strategic plan to kind of have look at the structure again and what the committees need to look like to drive the work and i'm sure i appreciate your point that could be revisited again you know so Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Okay. So, is there anything else anybody wants to add? I have one thing. Uh, yeah, add. sure. It's not around the committee structure, but uh, yeah. let a moment uh, be yeah. wasted. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I am one of the founding members of the Yamhole Early Learning Hub and still on the council and very active. And I just want to, you don't have to comment on it now, but I'm really hopeful that people, the state, yourself, and others are really paying attention and listening to the feedback you're getting around the sector plan. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of enormous concerns around that plan, the work, and um, timelines, and the, the, the value in it. And I think we're still having a lot of challenge finding where that's going to help our system internally move things that we feel like are important to move. So I just wanted to make sure you were happy about it. Yeah, thanks. And also, thank you for the student success act. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I think we're going to all that. But I have one more comment. Is it possible, Martha? Yep, go ahead. I guess I just wanted to encourage you, Miriam, just to, before there's any changes to any of the committee structures, that you recognize that we're totally here and at your disposal. <laughs> like, it'll be disruptive, right, when things get switched around. So since we are here right now, if there are things that are on your plate or that you're thinking about that you could use help or feedback on, I, I'm sure you're thinking about it, but I just encourage you to remember that we're here. And that Great. Really Thank you, Christy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Big problems for both of us. Yeah. Are you going right now? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. I went last week after a cool night. So it was. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do right now? But it was, you know, it's a government. 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 Government.